Huh? Got new carpet. <laughs> I thought you want more. No, I always want more. But I brought out the information. <sighs> I think we could still go into full session and talk about it. Oh, we can't. Oh, yeah. Um, Look at that we time. don't have a, a trigger. Let's we'll see if we're still. I mean, I, I can still be here at 11. I don't have to leave. We're not going to announce at 11. If... See? Yeah, and hey. that's the case with. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right on time. <laughs> we got five o'clock. Let's see how we're going to do Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Roll call. Greg Scott. Here. Mark Serbrook. Present. Ron Vaughn. Present. Brad Newbecker. Present. Jenny David. Here. Uh, are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? Uh, Commissioners? Can we add on at the end uh, uh, committee development for uh, GPS? Where would you like that? At the end, it's fine. Our post. <laughs> yeah, we're just after our post. How about, yes. Because we're also going to move uh, D the closed session to after uh, public comment. Because Greg cannot be with us until at least eleven o'clock. So we're going to be here till eleven. That's the best case scenario. If not, we'll just postpone it till next week. Okay. Any other additions or corrections? Okay. Uh, item two, we got public comment. There are two areas for public comment. I'm going to read this once. Um, on December 10, 2020, the Board of Commissioners approved Resolution 20-77 to adopt rules of procedure that include a structure for public comment. Each meeting agenda includes two opportunities for public comment. The first public comment period is limited to topics that appear on the meeting agenda. A second public comment period is reserved for public statements on any matter or issue that is relevant or germane to county government. Persons who wish to address the board are required to comply with the following. One, state your name for the record. Two, speak only to the chairperson. Three, stand behind the podium when speaking. Four, limit comments to three minutes or fewer and five, follow the direction of the chairperson when speaking. Board rules do not impose restrictions on subject matter. However, failure to follow the direction of the chairperson will result in not being able to talk or being removed from the meeting. The board chairperson reserves the right to sound the gavel when the audience applauds or derides a speaker. The board thinks to an advance your compliance with these rules. Public comment, this is for agenda items only. Any public comment in the room? Any public comment on the phone? Any public comment on the phone? Item 3A, we have appointments. Brian Goodenough, Foster, Swift, Collins, and Smith related to legal services proposal. That's me. Come on up, guys. Thank you. Yeah, come on up. Pull up a chair. Trish. Hey. Madam Chairwoman, thank you for having us. Council, thank you. Tim, thanks for inviting us. Um, we, the way we're going to approach this, unless you want to approach it differently, is give you a little overview of the firm and give you a little uh, background on how long we've been doing this and what we do and who we represent, some of the pitfalls that we see, some of the practice areas that, we're, uh, that we focus in individually, and then take any questions that you might have and sort of let you direct um, the interview process. It's not really our practice to come and preach at one of our city councils or our townships or our villages. We instead try to have a, a teamwork type approach, a feedback approach. And so we wanna make sure that we're addressing the areas that you're most interested in. On the web um, screen, we have Laura Genovich in the top left corner and Tom Hi, Maher. Hi, good morning, everyone. Tom Maher is over two. If we do our job right, You'll never see Tom Maher. Okay. <laughs> Tom Maher is our is our is, is our senior partner in litigation. Um, Laura Genovich is one of our county experts, and she's unable to be here today due to a county commission meeting. Okay. Um, Patricia Scott uh, is a. Well, you tell them it's your claim to fame. I'm a litigator and I'm also the practice group leader of our finance, real estate and bankruptcy practice group. So I govern all of that area. And she's from here. So. And I graduated here from Ogama Heights. So uh, Anne Serink is our firm president and um, 
She's also the head of our municipal practice group and I'm in our municipal practice group as well. Um, we have different focuses. So the firm itself has been around for 125 years. We've been handling municipal work the entire time, uh, all the way back with Kent when it was Campbell and Foster, and Lindemer, Lindemer became a Supreme Court justice and the history goes on and on, but it's always had a municipal base component uh, as part of the firm's makeup. We have just shy of 100 lawyers uh, in the firm spread over five different offices, uh, Lansing, Grand Rapids, St. Joe, Holland and Southfield. Um, our firm is broken into six general, six, seven general practice groups. Uh, we have an employment services practice group, which handles employee benefits. Um, it handles uh, all labor issues, contract negotiations, arbitrations. Um, we have two lawyers that are devoted solely to labor. That's the only thing that they do. Uh, one of them is our chief negotiator for uh, union contracts. Um, I specialize in zoning and land use. That's really my area of expertise. Um, I taught at Cooley for over a decade uh, in zoning and land use. Uh, that's where I practice. Uh, I, I, with Tom Maher, handle um, one of the largest municipal insurance carriers uh, in the state of Michigan. It's Tokyo Marine, Houston Casualty and Claims. Um, used to be known as Midwest Claims. Uh, we handle 32 different counties uh, for any litigated matters that they receive. We also serve as general counsel. Uh, Anne is a general um, municipal lawyer as well as an expert in freedom of information and open meetings. Uh, she, it's incredible that somebody could specialize in Freedom of Information Act and Open Meetings Act, but the clients that she's handled, uh, not the least of which was Michigan State University during a pretty turbulent time over the last uh, three or four years to deal with all of their FOIA requests. And there were many and many. Um, so she's very up to date on law and she can address the issues there. We've seen a lot of pending litigation that's come out of the recent changes in Freedom of Information Open Meetings Act. There are a lot of changes that we need to be cognizant of. And so she's familiar with that. And Laura Genovich, like I said, um, I think she's in the Muskegon County uh, Board of Commissioners meeting later today at some point in time. And so we couldn't bring her on the trip. The reason that we break ourselves down into smaller sub-practice groups within practice groups is so that when you have a particular area or a particular concern, you can get a hold of us and we probably know the answer. We represent over 200 municipalities in the state of Michigan currently. Uh, some of them are handled as a general counsel basis. Some of those are handled on a, on a more of a project direct basis. Um, we have an environmental, we have an entire environmental team so in cases, oftentimes when there's an environmental issue or brownfield development issue, uh, our environmental team will handle it because general counsel for some of the smaller communities that we work with uh, doesn't feel comfortable handling it. And so that would be an example of a project-based approach. We do a lot of code enforcement. Uh, we write a lot of ordinances. Uh, we're really familiar now with wind energy and solar energy and the pitfalls associated with the zoning related to that and how we develop that. Some communities uh, want them, some communities do not want them. And so, uh, you know, we know really how to, how to direct those issues. We view our role as your roadmap. Um, we don't set policy, uh, that's not our job, that's your job, and we work for you. So we give you the best options uh, and we try to give you more than one option so that you as policy makers uh, for the county, and figure out what approach works best for the county. Uh, we tell you the risks associated with the various uh, approaches that we're suggesting, and then whatever direction you choose to go uh, with all of the information that we can provide you leaves you with an informed decision that you make, and then we help you to implement that. But again, it's a team approach for us. Um, you know more about this county than we could ever know about this county. Even though we do our research and, and we pay attention to what's going on, you live here on a daily basis. And so without that interaction, without that team approach, uh, we, simply, uh, we simply wouldn't be nearly as effective as, as we believe we are. I'm going longer than I wanted to because I want to get the, give these guys a chance. But the one thing I do want to stress to you is that most of our municipal clients have been with us for decades. Uh, so when we, when we 
form a relationship with a new client, uh, we're in it for the long haul. And so we start from ground zero. Uh, we first try to figure out what, you know, what are the, what are the issues that the county is currently facing and how do we get you to where you want to go? And one of the first things that we often do is we'll take a look uh, at your ordinances because you'd be surprised how many times we find ordinances that are just simply out of date. Um, and so we kind of, we kind of get a feel for what the issues are um, here, and then we try to figure out how we engage in maybe some preventive uh, type approaches. Uh, the lawyers at our firm uh, and the staff at our firm, uh, there's longevity, there's not turnover. And my secretary's been there for almost 50 years. She started when she was, well, she'd kill me if I told you when she's so. <laughs> <laughs> leave it at that. Because it's probably in Victoria. <laughs> so we won't tell you that. But she's been there. Really said too much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've already said too much. The secretary that was there before her had been there for 50 years. So we don't turn over internally and we don't turn over with our clients. We're very loyal to our clients. Um, we do not believe. In our, in our philosophy is that I don't care whether you're uh, Livingston County uh, or Clare County or Ogama County, every county operates under the same set of laws. You have the same enabling statutes, you have the same issues. Uh, they may be at a different scale, but we treat every single one of our clients exactly uh, as we do the next. Um, and so we've given you our proposal. Um, we can talk about that in detail with you. We have not offered you a retainer option. I can tell you, I've been doing this for 30 years. In my experience, our experience, retainers simply do not work. They just don't work for us. Um, and we've tried them. Uh, we've worked on that, you know, and it's, it's a real trust relationship that you get into with a client when you do that. And it's not the fact that we don't trust the new client. It's the fact that nobody really understands what a retainer entails. There's always an argument over, was well, that in the retainer or is that outside the retainer? Is that hourly? Is that not hourly? And at the end of the day, we just find that you have better control of your cost. You have control of how things, um, how your legal budget develops. <clears throat> and uh, we, we ask for the trust from you that we don't bill you for every, every time you pick up a phone call and you call and say, hey, do you guys have a new ordinance that deals with wind energy or solar energy? You know, we don't run to our timesheets and write down 0.3 telephone call from counts or from uh, the county requesting information on solar energy. We just don't do that. And so there's a lot of things that we do that we don't bill you for. Uh, finally, um, the last thing I wanna to touch on and then I'll turn it over to Ann, but um, seminars, we're big on seminars. We like to come down here at your convenience and provide you with maybe a, an informational seminar to the Zoning Board of Appeals or your planning commission, bring them up to speed. I mean, sign ordinance right now, sign ordinance, uh, given the decision in read, is, is a horrible thing for communities. Even the courts don't understand them, but communities now are getting sued right and left because of their sign ordinances. And those are things that we think if we can educate you up front that's the best preventive maintenance that we can, can give you. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Ann and anybody else that you have questions of. Laura Genovich will probably be one of your main contacts. Um, we try to give you a main contact person. Uh, that's the way that we work. Uh, three things you'll get from us. You make a phone call, you'll get a phone call back that day, okay? We all have backups, uh, but you'll have a primary person within which to make contacts. So I have to search around. You're going to see the same person. You're not gonna have different people bouncing in and out of your meetings. There's no continuity that way. Um, we don't need to be re-educated as to what happened at the last meeting because we will have been at the last meeting, whether it be by Zoom or by uh, in person if that becomes necessary. Um, so that's the, that's the first thing you're going to get. The uh, second thing actually you're gonna get a return call on the day you make it, you're gonna have a, a contact person that's there and you're always going to have the person who is most knowledgeable in the area where you have an issue working on that matter. And uh, this, is, this is a small part of the team. And the employment services guys aren't here, the corporate guys aren't here, the condemnation lawyers aren't here. Uh, we handle the road commission work. So we're pretty well versed in covering any areas where we think you could have a concern. So.
sorry to be so long, but I tried to cram it all in as quickly as I could. Go ahead. Well, I just, I, I think I want to, because Brian covered a lot of the stuff that I think one of our focus is teamwork and we have a lot of our team here just because I want, we want to show you that we have a number of people, we have backups to our backups, we have a lot of different areas of expertise, but I guess, um, you know, this is your, this is your meeting, you know, what, how, we want to ask how you want to proceed if you want to ask questions or if you want us to provide more information at this point. I, I think we'd like to ask a few questions. If sure. Okay with that. Yeah. I, I guess my question you guys would start with is, is why do you want Oldham County? Who wants to answer that? I can answer that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm happy to answer that and I'm happy to be here. And, you know, I, Brian indicated the law is the same for everybody and representation. I don't want to say that's the easy part, but um, doing the legal work in, in some respect is the easy work. What's important is the relationships, right? And understanding and meeting people where they live. And I know where you all live because I've lived here. <laughs> and so to have the opportunity to help Ogemaw County, I know you face some challenges, we all know that. To be able to help you would be, would be something that we would be able to do given our experience. I won't call Brian old, but he's earned that gray right hair. <laughs> um, so to be able to, with our experience and our, you know, our expertise, I think that we could help Oklahoma County a lot and it would be our, our privilege to do so. Commissioner Becker? No, it was a very, very nice uh, presentation. Um, very um, informative. Um, yeah, you were humble and, uh, and you obviously have a very good uh, reputation and uh, resume. So. Thank you. Thank you for coming in to see us today. Yeah, we appreciate the opportunity. And can, if I could just expand on what Trish said. So I, I live in the city of DeWitt, which is a small town. And I represent the city of DeWitt. And I can tell you that when you're from the community that you represent, or you have roots in the community that you represent, there's, <laughs> you don't, I, and, I, and this kind of sounds like I'm being contradictory to what I said earlier. We treat everybody the same. But when you have a passion, mm -hmm. because it's your hometown, that makes a difference. And I can tell you that a lot of times I don't, I probably shouldn't say this on camera either, but sometimes I don't build a city into it for the things that I do because I live there and I'm very concerned about how things come out. I don't direct their policy, but I make sure that there's a passion there that I wanna make sure that you know they, they see it, they feel it, I live there. I just think it's an, an important piece of the puzzle that often gets overlooked. Mr. Vaughn? Um, what would you hope to accomplish in the first year as our attorney? I, I think one of the things that we, we like to do when we, we start with a new client is, it's, to me, it's a two, sort of a, a two-fold process. One is to obviously meet with you, meet with the different um, you know, boards and commissions and you know, your elected officials and figure out what your, what your concerns are, what your top concerns are. Um, so that's first and foremost, one of the things that we do. Um, the second thing that we do is based on our experience. Um, for example, I, I do all the freedom of info, or not all, but a lot of the freedom of information I've worked for the firm. And I have, what I like to do when I start with a new client is to figure out what your processes are. What do your policies look like? How do you normally respond? Because there's um, a lot of liability with FOIA. People send FOIA requests in and there's a lot of lawsuits and they're hard to get rid of because they get their attorney's fees paid for if you lose. So not only do you have to pay your lawyers, but then you have to pay their lawyers. So um, one of my goals is never to get into those lawsuits. We don't want to in, you know, involve Tom at all uh, with proactive treatment, making sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed with how you do your denial letters, for example. Um, those things go a long way. So really figuring out what, what's important to you, what are your you know, top goals? I know you have a millage coming up. We, you know, I review millage material, figuring out what you know, election needs you would have, some of those hot, high, hot items that come from, come from you. you know, we, we can read your minutes. We can figure out what you've done over the last year, but really knowing what your top priorities are is something that we, we would come in and do. But also, again, based on our expertise, expertise, there's probably a few things that I would look at. How does, you know, I, I thought your um, public comment policy was fantastic. A lot of communities don't have a public comment policy. So things like that, making sure your Open Meetings Act um, processes are in place. Those, those are the types of things we would do. I do a lot of training. I just, we just had a new city come on board uh, recently. And um, I did a, for example, a, a webinar for not only their elected officials, but at, you know, a lot of their employees so that they understand, for example, that they have duties to collect records for, if you send an information, if you're a FOIA coordinator and you send them a request for information, how, how important it is for them to meet the deadlines and get the information back to you because there's a lot of liability there. So those, 
those types of uh, training, Brian mentioned that already, are things that we do regularly in the beginning. And if I can uh, jump in on that up here on the screen in the back, I'm Laura Genovich, uh, and I do a lot of work with our county clients. Um, building on what Ann said, we really like to have an understanding as well of what kind of public works and public infrastructure projects might be coming down the road so that we can help the county plan for that. We do have bond counsel in our firm, so you don't have to go outside to another law firm to get your bond, bond counsel services. Um, we negotiate and draft and review a lot of contracts um, both the simple day-to-day -day and the complex um, you know, sewer and water contracts and things like that. Um, so we like to have an idea of, of what's coming down the pipeline, uh, no pun intended, when it comes to public works um, so that we can um, help the county move forward with those things as well. And the other thing with, with the millage work, so we're in the tax tribunal on a regular basis as well. So if, uh, if any of your millages or taxes or other issues, tax assessments get challenged, uh, we have the expertise to be in the tax tribunal and we're in there, oh, I, I would say we're in there every month in some form of litigation, uh, whether it be litigation against a large corporation uh, like, like a Walmart or a Meyer or where they're trying to, to address their tax issues um, or whether it be a, a homeowner who has decided to take you to the tax tribunal. Uh, so we have the expertise there as well. Yeah, and a, a lot of times those will involve local units, but we but definitely have um, major tax tribunal cases on behalf of um, Marquette County in the past, Van Buren County involving large taxpayers um, up in the UP, it's large mines um, that have um, various, not just property tax, but equalization and some other um, interesting issues. Um, and I do some of that as well as Jack Van Coovering in our office, um, who's kind of well-known in the property tax world for representing the city of Escanaba in the Menard um, uh, dark store appeal. Um, and those issues can implicate counties as well with large taxpayers like uh, power plants and any other large taxpayers. Counties often wind up um, kind of entangled in that. Um, so I work uh, often with our equalization directors for counties, um, Donna Vandevries, who's pretty well known around the state in Muskegon County um, and others. Um, so there's, there's kind of a lot, as you know, that goes into um, representing a county. It's not maybe as, as narrow as with some other types of, of municipalities, but you know, from, the, from the labor and employment to the elections, um, to county apportionment issues, which have certainly been a hot topic uh, this year. We've represented counties and county apportionment commission with those. Um, we have with our team, the breadth and depth of experience to bring in the right person for that because we have generalists and we have specialists and all of us are well-connected. We're in communication with each other every day um, and, and as we kind of emphasize what Brian said earlier, um, as the main point of contact, you'll all have my, my cell phone number and you can text me. Um, and my clients often text me and that's usually a fast way to get a response. And of course, email and the old fashioned telephone work as well. Um, but we're, we're always you know, ready to kind of address those myriad issues that can come up for counties. That, that was one of my big questions was uh, what experience you guys have with millages because we, if you've been following Oklahoma County, that's uh, um, one of our hot topics right now is uh, Kirtland Community College whose location has changed and there's three millages that are involved uh, with this. So going forward, that was my question as far as what experience you guys have with millages. Yeah, and, and as well, I do a lot of work with millages. We do a lot of millage drafting. We've, um, and you know, we've solved a lot of, um, you know, I represent a lot of libraries and we'll figure out that they're not levying the millage correctly in certain places. So we've been able to resolve those issues. But, um, you know, with millage drafting, millage proposals, um, I've been doing that for 20, 25 years now. Um, and Laura and I handle the issues that come up with campaign finance, because um, sometimes there's when you're marketing the millage, you know, you have to be careful of how you do it, either have a ballot question committee or if the county wants to spend money, there's restrict restrictions to that. So we counsel clients on those issues as well. Commissioner Scott. Um, I'm looking at your municipal client list. I don't know, just seven counties and they're all south of here. I know you have a lot of communities from all the way from Houghton, Hancock, all the way down to the Ohio border. Uh, we compare a lot we, when we talk about the, uh, when we talk about a project or a situation we, we, we compare a lot to other counties and like there are different counties of our size uh, or our 
our size as far as uh, value and things like that. Um, one thing, uh, uh, since since Jenny brought it up, are you are you familiar with that community college uh, statute that was put in back in the '60s about mil community college millages? Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Actual, the I mean, I've I've looked at community college millage issues. I'm not exactly okay. sure about what the, the the specific statutory provision though is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you guys, I think you probably are, we represent Nuego County, mm -hmm. and you're very similar to Nuego County over by Grand Rapids. Um, a lot of our schoolcraft up in the UP. Schoolcraft in the UP. Um, it's on the list. Oh, it is on the list. Huh? Yeah, and that, that list is not exhaustive. I mean, we like I said, we represent over 200 municipalities, and so we didn't put them all on we, there. We were just hired by Cass County, too, which is a smaller municipality. That, That's not so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is a hot topic. We're talking about trees. meeting after meeting after meeting. Um, a couple of the villages don't have a sunset on them. The college is, is okay. to change locations and trying to find ways to the jurisdiction. get out okay. of, uh, yes, these villages who are actively working on that. So. Well, it's, it's certainly it's something that we, I mean, we, we address problems as they come up with villages all the time. And um, statutory interpretation and those types of things are certainly something we can jump in and handle very easily. Thank you. So I guess the... The other thing is, uh, without a retainer, we're talking hour for hour for everything, right? I'll tell you, we have found in our experience, and, and I don't know if your experience is different, but the retainers, uh, you will save money, is my prediction, on an hourly basis versus a retainer. I just believe, because every, re very seldom do you have a retainer that says, for X number of dollars, I will work for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can call me anytime you want, nonstop. Instead, what the retainer typically does is it carves things out. So it says, well, we have a base retainer over here. We'll answer questions if they fall in the base retainer. But if we think they fall outside the retainer, we're going to charge you hourly anyway. And so at the end of the day, it comes down to which basket is it falling in and who's making that determination? Because I can tell you, you're probably not making that determination the law firm that you hire is going to make that initial determination as to where that's going to fall. And if they can find a way, they being whoever they are, can find a way to take it out of the retainer box and throw it into the hourly box, that's probably, from a business model, that's probably where it's going to fall. I mean, let's be honest with one another. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. And then you don't want to get sideways with your lawyers. I mean, there's got to be a level of trust. And so if you're fighting over whether it's in basket A or basket B, you're already you're already kind of banging heads. And so we just don't, we just have found that you, you can save a lot of money by doing it on an hourly basis. And, and, a, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the projects we could give estimates to, I mean, we, we're, we're really cost conscious. I represent a lot of libraries that have very small budgets and I, what, what I don't like and what we don't like is sticker shock on a bill. So we don't want you to get a bill and realize that you think you've asked us an hour question and that we we took five hours on it you know those are the types of things I don't like that I don't like those types of situations so we like to engage in the conversation when the project comes in what the expectations are we have um so for example we do a lot of things like I uh you know I mentioned we do freedom of information act policies I I I spent I don't know how many hours developing our initial policy but instead of charging the first client out of the gate for that what I do is um we charge small flat fees so if you want a policy, it's the flat fee for that is $350, for example. So those are the types of things we try to do to um, use economies of scale because we have a lot of municipal clients. We have a lot of, as Laura mentioned, we have the breadth of expertise. And because of that, we can um, do provide services in a very cost-effective manner. You know, we don't, you know, we, we just don't get a lot of complaints about our bills, which is, which is, you know, something that, and I take a lot of pride in that. Okay. It doesn't do us. So I shouldn't yeah. base a judgment on how long it takes you to answer just a camp question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a point well taken. Yeah. <laughs> and he said it. Uh, you'll learn that that's a very odd question coming from. Mr. Scott, but anyways, it's two twenty-five an hour, correct? Did yeah, I read that correctly? Right. Right, Whatever we put in our original correct. Yes, yes, it's two twenty-five. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The voice. The voice. The voice. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, the voice coming from from beyond. <laughs> uh, hi, right? What's your What's your idea on on um, uh, attendance at our meetings? Would Would you make that a regular thing? Would you 
but it depends on what you want or would it be only on a request basis so my experience uh, when i when i started representing the city of dewitt and i just lived down the road from them uh, my <laughs> suggestion to them was you know look i don't really need to be here at every meeting there are meetings where you simply do not need me to be physically present their response is we want you physically present at every meeting we don't care we don't ask you one question all night it doesn't matter to us you're there the public sees you're there that's important to us um, now obviously I have other, we have other clients, all of us have other clients that say, no, we don't want you to come out, drive out here. Um, oh, we got Zoom. We yeah. have Zoom. And so, right. Yeah, we, we have Zoom. Yeah. And if I can jump in on that, other counties, similar size, Nuevo County, Cass County, um, we, have, we have attend on request only. They typically don't need us at every meeting, but we're able to be um, yeah. available on request. And Zoom does make it very easy. Um, you know, if anything came out of the pandemic, I think it was everybody gaining some Zoom skills. Um, so we have a number of clients now for whom, you know, I attend remotely. Um, that obviously saves uh, the county a lot of money. Um, allows It also allows not just for the board meetings, which is great, but to even jump on with staff by Zoom and have a video call. Um, you know, I was on a call yesterday with a, you know, county register of deeds and county clerk and some other county uh, folks on some important issues where it was just almost as good as sitting in the room with all of them. And we were able on short notice to jump on a Zoom call. So we all have that technology available um, and as, as probably your main contact person, um, I can make myself available for the meetings um, by Zoom. And I would just say, you know, on request and maybe at the beginning, um, we're feeling out how often that is and we'll probably get into a good rhythm of when you need me um, and when you don't. Um, because we don't want to just charge you for the sake of charging you, believe me, we only want to um, be here when we are providing value to you. So we leave that up to the county, but as I said, for, for many counties your size, um, it's it's not always necessary. And this is an incredible setup right here. Mm -hmm. What we do with some of our smaller communities, and we wouldn't need to do that because this is this is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a we have a I call it a globe, it looks like a globe. And we just provide it to the municipality that we represent where we do a lot of Zoom work. And it gives us a 360 degree um, view of the room during the course of the meeting. And the firm just provides that. You plug it in and it connects to us. And then we have the conversation. <clears throat> so that's something that, that record, probably does need. that record? Will you be able to go back? And Laura, does yep. that record? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But just, just like any other Zoom connection. Yeah. So you can the record camera. it. And, yeah. Like our yeah. meetings, you can go on YouTube mm -hmm. and watch them, you know. And, yeah, and everything, but yeah. from that yeah. point, <clears throat> and this wouldn't be for your for your recording purposes for your public. No, purpose. I was it's more so for us to communicate with you. Well, I think the thing is, it's like that other that uh, the wit is like like us. And once you get into a matter and you're talking about it, we get we get a half an hour of discussion into a matter. Then we say, oh, let's call the attorney. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't know anything what we talked about. Yeah. You didn't hear anything for the last half an hour. So now you're not going to be able to give us an answer because That's you correct. don't even know where we're at. That's correct. You know? Well, and we can't give you an informed answer because we don't have facts. Right, right. Yes, but if you know. were there listening to that half an hour, you might have a lot better idea to give us. I 100%. Agree. Yeah, that really is an advantage to having the streamed yeah. and report. Oh, sorry. Maybe we're, we're maybe we're driving down the wrong path. We took the the fork to the right, where you guys could have said, "Well, you guys should fork to the left." Stop the train. Yeah. Drive straight. But, but yeah, or drive straight. <laughs> the drive straight between the, the tree parts. right there. Yeah. Did you have any questions? You know what? From what they've said and the questions that our commissioners have asked, all my questions have been answered <laughs> several times, actually. So. Tim, did you have any? I have one more thing before Tim. I don't have anything anyway. Okay. I thought I'd ask. Um, so could, could you expand on uh, your experience with uh, Michigan Dream Code? Yep. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. What? Go ahead, Laura. Yeah. I was going to say, um, Mark Kerner in our Lansing office is a drain code expert. So as I said, we have kind of the generalists and uh, specialists, and he is he is the drain code um, expert in our firm. So we bring him in as needed on that. We do represent a lot of what I call, you know, county related entities like drain commissions, road commissions, health departments, you know, apportionment commissions. So, um, you know, as those issues come up, we can loop somebody in. Zoom makes that easy as well. The fact that we have a couple of offices is not an impediment because we can get somebody on a Zoom call just as quickly as we can get them on the phone. Yeah, that, that was our dilemma. We didn't know who to bring. To yeah. <laughs> um, we didn't bring our labor lawyers because we, how I, it, 
your contracts are all negotiated. And so you're good for three years on your contracts. So how often you're going to have a labor issue pop up in the next three years is probably remote. So we told those guys stay home. Um, you know, hopefully it's remote, right? Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but the people that we brought, I mean, primarily you're gonna have ordinance issues, you're gonna have zoning issues, you're gonna have taxing issues, you're gonna have millage issues. Uh, those are the areas where you're gonna have most of your questions or most of your immediate need for legal services. And so that's why we picked who we picked today. Had we known that there was an issue um, concerning the drain commissioner or, or, or drain work in general, then we would have had Mark Kerner pop and we still could again here in, in probably 20 seconds. But that's the advantage, I think, to having nearly 100 lawyers in our firm, all of which have a specialty. If you ask me a drain code issue, I'll give you one. But you would kind of like the answer. I'm happy to offer an opinion, as you can probably tell, but um, it's not the one you want to hear. It's like going to your uh, orthodontist to get your hearing checked. I mean, happy to give you an opinion that you can't hear, but he probably can't tell you how to fix it. So, it's another hot topic. Did you want to expand on that or no? Uh, just, uh, I guess, who, who you have uh, that has uh, drain code. Be Mark Kerner. Mm -hmm. Mark, Mark Kerner. Mark mm -hmm. Kerner. Yeah, and I think does he? I think he handles Clinton County Drain Commissioner's work and Jackson County. I think he does some work. For, no, he doesn't do work for Jackson County Drain Commissioner, does he? I'm not exactly sure which commissioners he works with, but it's a it's a bigger area it's statewide. And again, that's a very specific area of the law that you call him. He knows the answer. You call us. We can find you the answer, but. Here's where you avoid the unnecessary expenditure of legal fees for us to go research it when we walk down the hall and go, hey, what's the answer to this issue? Yeah, I don't I don't think and jump in if I'm I don't think that we're in our representation of counties that we've had something that we don't have somebody that can handle. You know, that, that's, that, that's correct to my knowledge, yeah. both with our smaller counties yeah. and large counties like Muskegon. Yeah. Um, and, you, you know, a lot of unique issues come up and uh, we've been able to handle everything in house. Yeah, I mean, they have they have like transportation authority issues. We've got Mark is our transportation authority expert. I, I represent two libraries in your county. I'm, I do library law. There's there's a lot of uh, like niche expertise we also have that can become helpful with counties. In, the, in this county, you say? Okay. West, West Branch. West Branch. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you have any other questions? Uh, well, just uh, get touch on your ideas of how you're going to communicate with us I mean, or with the with the key holders and the shareholders in the in our county. Just just don't want to maybe you can. Yeah, I think I, yeah, so I think I understand the question. So what we find to be ineffective is a shotgun approach where just any one of you can call uh, without permission from a key person within the county uh, so that we get, you know, you, you call me and you call me and you call me and you all have a different question on the exact same issue but none of you know the answer because you got an answer, you got an answer, and you got an answer. And then you come into the meeting and everybody says, well, Foster Swift told us this. No, Foster Swift told me that. Well, yeah. So what we try to do is we have a key person to be that contact and then you run through them. Now, there are issues where a commissioner may say, look, I want to talk to the lawyer. All I want is the permission to talk to the lawyer. And I don't want to have a conversation with Jim as to what I want to talk to him about. I just want to have a personal conversation with him. And Tim says, that's fine if Tim's your contact person. And that call is made and we answer it. But what we do not do, because we don't work for any one person, we don't pick allegiances, we give you the law and you make the decisions, but we make sure that everybody knows after that conversation takes place, unless it's something really personal that doesn't have anything to do with the county, and then we wouldn't be charging the county. But well, we also want to make sure, because we represent the county, as a whole, we don't represent individual commissioners. And so one of our other challenges that we also want to make sure is that we're representing the majority interests. So, you know, some, you know, a lot of times your decisions are, are, are unanimous. Sometimes there's a split and a controversy and we have to, we just want to make sure that our communication lines are such that we understand who we're, who we're supposed to be um, reporting, to. reporting to. And a lot of that is dictated by you, you guys as a, as a, as a board might say only through, you know, 
the administrator or board chair, whoever you guys decide, that's that can be up to you. If you want our input on it, we'd be happy to do that. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're um, representing the county, which is our client, um, and, and the majority interest in that. So that's the best way for you to control your own legal costs. Yeah. We have a policy on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and counties counties differ from cities and uh, townships and things. We have we have we share responsibilities with other elected officials, right? Mm -hmm. Not just commissioners. Right. right. You think, you know, you've got you've got the prosecutor's office and the sheriff's department too, and you've got a lot of different entities. And you know, we we work with all of those within the. Right. You know, I understand. Yeah. You work with them. Yeah. And how does the communication flow then? Well, typically, and Laura can jump in too, like for yeah. example, um, um, you know, I just had a joint meeting, for example, with this, with the county administrator and the prosecutor's office, because we we're figuring out how they wanted to handle their FOIAs and those types of things. And so we have those joint meetings to make sure everybody's on the same page um, as well, because we don't want what problems that way. Um, so that's just one example. Laura, I don't know. If you yeah, have a... typically the county administrator will be the gatekeeper, even with, for example, a county clerk register of deeds um, or others who have questions for county corporation council. Um, and that's the way they've chosen to do it. Um, and it tends to work well, because I don't think in those cases, the county administrator saying, no, you can't. It's more a matter of coordinating it so that everybody's on the same page and it's done as efficiently and cost effectively as possible. So the county administrator might gather questions and information and then send it to me um, and I'll get back directly with him and then he disperses the information. Or as I mentioned, I just had a video call this week with a lot of uh, elected officials and stakeholders in a county um, and that was coordinated by the county administrator where he said to me, can you make yourself available for a meeting today? I said, of course. Um, and he, his office put together the Zoom and we jumped on it. Um, um, so that's been a good way in my experience. It's perhaps not the only way, but it, it has worked well. Um, and then when commissioners have had um, legal questions, either those come through the county administrator, again, kind of in a gatekeeper uh, capacity, or sometimes there'll be actually a motion at a, at a county board meeting to direct corporation counsel to do certain research or look into certain issues, particularly where there may be some cost to it. Um, so if it's an issue where the, where the county thinks, you know, this might this might cost a thousand dollars. We want to make sure a majority of the county board uh, commissioners are are okay with that. Then they'll do it as an official kind of county action. So, um, so you're, you're right. Um, the issues facing counties are different than those facing um, cities and townships. Um, and although we represent both, um, I'm very familiar with with the differences between them. Our policy states it's through you. Mm -hmm. Right. That would be the usual mm -hmm. methodology. It's either you. I, I very rarely call Greg. <laughs> When I call them, you know about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's a, it's a good, it's a good, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Sure. Guys, I think we got, I think you guys did a very good job. Well, thank you for inviting us. Thanks for the us. opportunity. We really you. appreciate thank it. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, these are a little bit updated because okay. the original proposal that we gave you, it not, there's not a big significant change in it, but it's a nice fresh copy. And... So Tim will be in contact with you guys. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Thank so, you. Guys. Thank you. Okay, next we, next we have uh, Rebecca Yunker, Northern Michigan Children's Assessment Center. Hi. Hi, good morning. Thank you. How are you? I will not be that long. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go to law school? <laughs> I could be long winded. Oh, but thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so as the executive director of the Northern Michigan Children's Assessment Center, I appreciate the opportunity to come on a yearly basis and give you an update. I think we missed last year with everything going on. Um, there's been a lot of exciting things happening. Um, as you know, our mission is to reduce the trauma of child abuse and neglect by providing prevention, intervention, and advocacy. Um, so we appreciate we just celebrated our eighth year, um, which is amazing. Um, I just hired another therapist, which will give me three full-time therapists. Um, so with our forensic interviewer, our program coordinator, we have a full medical program. We have nurses on call. We have advocates on call that respond 24-7 to any sexual assault child or adult who needs those services within 
you know, that immediate time frame. We do non-acute exams at our center. Um, so we'll have a staff of 10. So in eight years, you know, we have grown, expand. We continue to provide um, those services to all of Okama County families. We work closely with the Sheriff's Department, with uh, West Branch PD, and with MSP. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about how what we are doing is helping your community and saving you money. Um, so when I first, you know, came, you know, to, to northern Michigan from Grand Rapids and opened the center eight years ago, um, that was our goal, you know, was really the services that we can provide for the community and make sure that we are providing the best services for kids when there's allegations of child abuse and neglect. Um, we recently had a little girl, she came to the center a few months ago, um, had disclosed to her mom, she didn't want to go to a family function. And through a little tenter tantrum, through a fit, she was bound to determine not to go to this family function. So mom sat down and talked with her and had a heart to heart. And the little girl disclosed every time they go to these family functions, there's an older cousin there who plays a touching game with her, has told her for years not to tell. She's kept it a secret and never disclosed. And finally, she did. This older cousin was 10. So mom reports it. Uh, we get that little girl into the interview. She comes to the interview. She discloses that abuse, discloses how this um, older cousin is touching her, telling her to keep it a secret and how she wants it to stop. So we interview her, we bring our team, every case we work with law enforcement, if we have to work with protective services, we have our whole multidisciplinary team that handles these cases to make sure that we're providing the best services possible. So then um, we decided as a team with consulting, our, we always consult with our prosecutor's office, if we ever start, typically we don't interview offenders. Um, this is the victims that's coming through our center. Here we have a 10 year old juvenile offender. So we consult with our prosecutor, made the decision, we're gonna bring that 10 year old into the center, interview him, what is going on with this 10 year old? Um, so the prosecutor had already determined, you know, more than likely, we're not gonna prosecute a 10 year old. What can we do to get that child the help they need? So we did, we bring that 10 year old in, we work together as a team, law enforcement's there. A uh, 10 year old comes in, um, scared, afraid, frightened. Can you imagine what that experience would have been like for that 10 year old to have to go down to the police department and talk to officer in uniform um, and, and have that experience? At our center, you know, he was able to be interviewed by our forensic interviewer in a room by himself. Law enforcement observes from another room. He broke down, he cried, he admitted to everything that he had done to his cousin and started talking about how he had found pornography and was viewing a lot of pornography. Never disclosed that he was sexually abused himself. Um, talked about how he knew it was wrong and wanted help. Think about that experience. If that 10 year old would have not gotten the help he needed, where would that 10 year old be in two, three years that behavior is going to continue, that behavior is still going to start, that 11, 12, 13 year old then is going to be petitioned to juvenile court, get involved in your juvenile court system, cost you money through juvenile court, through your child care funds, and cost us how much money in the future. Think of that little girl who disclosed being touched. If she doesn't get the help that she needs, what do we see our teenage girls in juvenile court? How many of these teenage girls, teenage pregnancy, depression, suicide, drug and alcohol, and how many of them have a history of sexual abuse that never got the help they needed? So as we continue at the Jones Assessment Center, that's our passion and our mission. Let's get the kids the help that they need. We can prevent all those juvenile um, delinquents, get them the help so they can grow up, live in your community, live in your society as healthy kids. The past year, we have provided, well, and actually only a year to date. So we still got a month left, um, hitting December already. But we had had 62 kids from Ogama County come to the Children's Assessment Center. That's more than one a week that these kids are coming to the center that we're getting referrals on. 
we have provided 156 therapy sessions to these kids. So these kids are getting the help that they need. They, we can help them get through their trauma. My therapists are trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, EMDR. They do play therapy. There's another technique that's called smart therapy, which is a sensory motor um, regulation therapy. So our therapists get the best training to provide these services. We had 371 sessions of ad advocacy. I have a family advocate who meets with the families, who meets with the guardians, who provides the services and helps support these families through that process. So she is talking with these families and providing those services. We had five kids that reached that level. They had to come back to us for non-acute exams um, and had to receive a medical exam. Um, four came to us on acute cases. So these are kids that are disclosing that they were assaulted within five days. 120 hours is our um, protocol for an acute exam. In September, we had nine SANE exams, which is a sexual assault SANE exam. One was an adult. Eight of those were 18 and under that were coming to us on sexual assaults. Year to date, four of those offenders have already applied to their offenses. So they're already being sentences, they're going through the court systems. Um, so we're getting those offenders off the streets. So they're not gonna be out there abusing more kids in Ogama County. So with your continued support, we can continue to provide these services. We assist these victims in here, the healing process. And what we wanna do and work with you to create a community where abusing kids is not acceptable. And we hope that's, that's the mission, our passion, um, and what we wanna to communicate to you. The last few years, oh, I have goodies. Goodies, goodies. So the last few years have been very challenging. So here's a little treat to help you get through the day. Um, we all know with COVID, things have, things have been tough. It's been tough on our kids. It's been tough for all of us. Let me pass those around. Don't check it out. <laughs> See what's inside. Can't wait for Christmas. So, um, with COVID, we have seen an increase in child abuse cases. <laughs> what we have also seen is an increase in the severity of our cases. Um, my staff has not, they, they're talking to me on a regular basis about how difficult these cases are because of the severity. We went a full year almost with these kids not having anybody to disclose to. They weren't in school, they weren't going to doctors, they weren't going to daycare. So who are they talking to, you know? So we went, you know, a while um, where kids are isolated and continue to be endangered. So we continue now to see the after effect of that the after effects. With our pandemic shutdown, fundraising has been difficult. We're seeing a decrease in just our community support. People are out of work, people aren't working. They don't have the extra funding to support nonprofits. We're lucky if we can do fundraising events um, depending on you know, the time of year and what restrictions we're under. Um, we're getting back into that, but we have seen a decrease in our community support. Our biggest funding source is VOCA. So VOCA is a victim of a crime act. And that has seen a 70% decrease in the last few years of the funds. Partly, it's the way that funding is set up. And if you're familiar with that funding source, VOCA funds get contributed into that fund when there's been a trial. Someone goes to trial, they're found guilty, they have to pay those fines and fees, that goes into the VOCA fund. We have been fighting for years um, to expand that to not to only a trial, but when someone pleads. And especially the last two years, our prosecutors were under a lot of pressure to accept pleas and because we didn't want people in jail. And so the more that we were accepting pleas and people paying those fines and fees, that money was not going into the bulk of funds that support CACs. We have about 35 children's advocacy centers in Michigan, and that's our biggest funding source. Um, and July, on July 20th, the president did sign, it's called the VOCA Fix. So the VOCA Fix is going to help our funding. So it will restore that money that was allocated. So what they did is they opened up that funding source saying, if you're going to court, whether you plea, whether you um, go to trial, no matter what, and you have those fines and fees, that money now will go into VOCA. It's going to take three to five years, though, 
for us to be able to see that funding. Um, I see you have on your agenda, the American Rescue Plan. Um, that does allow you to use those funds for agencies that provide mental health services. Mental health is a huge area that the American Rescue Plan, we have an ask into our governor to help our state chapter. Um, I think we asked for about $10 million of ARP funds from the state that would help support all those 35 centers. I have commitments already from Ross Common and IOSCO that they're using ARP funds to help with the allocations that the county is giving to the center because of our mental health services that we provide for the kids. I have asked, I previously have asked um, all the commissioners to uh, allocate $3,000 to the center to help support our services. I did ask, um, I am putting in a request um, for the $5,000. Like I said, we have another therapist who is starting. Um, she's starting actually April or uh, December 13th. So that's gonna provide better services for our kids. Um, we're gonna add a date up to IOSCO. We see a lot of Olga County kids go to IOSCO for services. So it's gonna give options the families in Oldham County, two options to go to Ross Common or to IASCO to get services. We help, you know, a lot of this funding that we get from our commissioners and then from the counties is to really to make sure that we're getting our um, staff to the best training possible, that we're providing gas cards to the families so they can get back and forth, that we're providing the counseling services or the counseling tools and equipment that our therapists need to be able to provide the best services possible. Um, so uh, I do have the allocation. Um, so there's the contractor, the agreement for 2022 that you can look over. Um, if you need any more information in regards to, I know every county is doing their ARP funds a little different. I've met with some individual committees and I've submitted proposals. Um, so I'm not sure how you are reviewing your ARP funds, but I'd be more than happy to talk with you more about that. <laughs> Or hasn't formally set up a process yet. Okay. For that, but it, that's part of what we talked about today. Okay. I saw that on the agenda. I thought perfect timing. Yeah, I had because I met with both Ross Common and I also have smaller committees that I've met with. So, so this is three thousand dollars. We've been getting three thousand dollars. So this is just a continuation. And right. You're asking for, for another. Correct. Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure I got that clear. So we need that on for resolution yes. the next next week. Yes. Okay. Any questions for her? I'm aware of your services. So we are so physically. I am oh. aware of. Oh, you're aware. I think you said, where are they? Yeah. No, no. Thank you. I'm yeah. I'm very aware of them. Yeah. Uh, I know friends of mine that have had to use your services. And uh, and that's been that's, uh, very successful. So. Um, We, yeah. we hope we may, we, we hope in long term making a difference and have that vision um, that hopefully our I numbers will go right. down. We're definitely making a difference. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, just what's your opinion on um, our response to COVID, the pandemic, um, with kids 18 and under, mm -hmm. as far as uh, the, the effect that it's had on uh, suicide and depression? It has completely increased it. Yes, our kids, we're seeing even the kids coming in for counseling, um, not only the trauma of the sexual abuse that they've experienced, you know, 85% of our cases are sexual abuse, um, just that isolation and the struggles in school and that communication with their friends and the sporting events. Um, a lot of times our therapists are working on those issues and helping them get through how they're feeling in regards to everything that's happened these last two years before they're even starting to get into the issues of their abuse. Um, so yeah, it has had a huge impact. We are seeing our kids. I probably about 10% of our interviews were probably ending in a suicide assessment, um, which we did not do before COVID. You know, we would have, we train all of our, our interviewers. If they're in the middle of that interview and a child that starts making any kind of comments or statements, you know, that they jump right into a suicide assessment. And we would do a few, you know, here and there. Um, and that we're seeing that more common. I got a call last night from the under sheriff in Ross Common um, that they were dealing with a 15 year old suicide call. Um, and it was a girl that had just been to the center the day before. Um, so a huge increase. And you think it's, um, is there any, any other concerns besides isolation and sexual abuse? Um, 
you know, I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of factors, you know, I drug and alcohol has, you know, um, it, the economy, you know, and parents not, you know, working and not being able to afford daycare, they can't even get to daycare. So there's a lot of factors, I think, that take that into effect. And um, we have seen, you know, an increase too. You know, I know talking with our jail administrators too, with, you know, people, drugs and alcohol, and then, you know, kids being neglected and um, that physical abuse. And I think physical abuse rises when there's a lot of stress in the home. Um, you know, parents are on, you know, they get on their last whim. And so, you know, we work closely with protective services also, you know, making sure that we're trying to get um, the families at the support they need. And that's, you know, the 371 sessions of advocacy. That's what my family advocate is doing is, you know, helping to support these families so then they can support the kids in their home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a great day. Enjoy your treats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any Anybody other questions, else? feel free to let me know. <laughs> I might get into yours. Brucey, we have Brent Giltner related to the county clerk related to adjustments to work hours. Um, what? The carpet wasn't enough. Huh? The carpet wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> Carpet didn't do payroll this time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't get Craig Scott to come in and, and work for my girls. I'd <laughs> follow things all up. You wouldn't want me. <laughs> um, no. So what I'm asking for is Tracy and Diana, just those two positions um, to get bumped up to 40 hours, just because the workload that those two specifically. They need more hours. They've, we've always needed more hours for those two. And instead of coming to you guys every couple of months, asking for a couple of weeks with the additional, um, I'm asking if we can just make those two until the end of the fiscal year. Is that what? Fiscal year? That's Is that? I, 10 more months. Well, you told me a timeline. Well, that would be I certainly the cleanest. I mean, be, yeah. But if this was a temporary workload increase or something like that, I mean, it were it's, months or whatever. It's not temporary. They they their workload warrants forty hours. So right now they're working thirty six. Okay. So what? The five extra like what? Are, just eight hour days instead of seven hour days, just for those two. I can just uh, offer some input, at least in Tracy's case. We uh, had a what you call it, Zoom meeting yesterday with our uh, Nova Time group and building the platform, if you will, so that it works the way we really want it to work. Uh, has no question put additional workload on Tracy because <clears throat> she's having to deal with this, helping construct this new thing while we still have to, to keep she's still run the operation uh, with. You know, the current payroll the way it is and everything else is going on uh her her participation in that is absolutely critical if she doesn't understand this system we're in a world of hurt particularly at this stage when it's being built and i know this is going to go on uh, at least through february in addition to whatever else the clerk's office is experiencing uh, so there's definitely if there was any question of justification for doing this uh, it's there and in tracy's case um it is, and I, I totally get this, is easier to do some of that um, more technical uh, data entry and everything that goes on with it when you're not doing it, trying to uh, uh, deal with clients or clients, the public coming in who need services as well. So for her to have the extra time after the office closes its doors to just simply focus on that, definitely I think would help her in a, at least in an efficiency manner, getting this, this other work uh, accomplished as well, while yet yeah, not cutting services to the public coming in needing right. those services. So just for, for my, my two cents, it's definitely been a, uh, nothing that surprises us, but definitely been an increase in the workload, at least at the front end of getting this system in place. And we are all going to benefit greatly from it when it is in place. You know, so yeah, she's had well a positive things to say about it. It's just... Yeah getting to the point where we can function with it. <clears throat> what about Diana's workload? What's, what's increased there? She, while well, she's doing some things to, to fill in to help Tracy when she's. Okay. 
that's the increase. Mm -hmm. Well, she's, she always has does a she, lot of work to do. Does she work more hours currently? Does she not get her work? Diana. Yeah. So there's more work for her to do. There's more work than, there's done. more work for her than 35 hours a week. When we lost the full-time position, how many years ago was that? Five, four? Shortly before me. Yeah. So when they lost that full-time position, she took on a greater workload. Um, it's always been there. The workload has always been there, but she's just been trying to get as much done as she can in 35 hours. And she, it's justifiable for her to be here for 40 hours to get everything done she needs to get done. And then, like I said, helping fill in with what Tracy can't get done in terms of the financial stuff. There's lots of huge assets for your department. I mean, Tracy's done an amazing oh, job. She had yeah. big shoes to fill and has done yeah. very well. Mm -hmm. Diana's What's, always answered the questions and is a great resource. Yeah, yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Once Nova's up and running, will, will it be a time saver? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Greatly reduce the amount of time that needs to be spent on the payroll Monday, entering yeah. numbers, you know, taking time sheets, logging them in. That step will be gone. Yeah. Because it'll all already be there. And again, assuming and I'm very confident we'll get there in terms of building all the nuances into the system, literally everything will be added up before it, it gets there. The system will do it. So what Tracy needs to do now is push the button to distribute the uh, checks and it's going to be done. Uh, so let's say there won't be a manual tweak here or there, but it'll be nothing like the time she has to spend now. Right. Mainly right. I'm fine with even like if we can just until February, March, until that's up and running and then reassess it well, to see months. how much that's perfect. That would be uh, amazing. That would be huge for my office. How about three months? Three months and we reassess. No. Give them how about five? <laughs> Well, <laughs> you'll hear four and a half. I mean, I have two. Well, right. I understand it was complex. Sold. We have two confident, very confident works, and, and it seems difficult yeah. to explain. So. And we're just asking for an explanation so that yeah. we have an idea. We don't know what your office does or. Yeah. or we do right. say everything. Up to six months and reevaluate it. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. thinking. That's what I'm I, thinking because because I don't think three is enough because it, it's going to take us. Time to it's work It's going to take at least out. two just mm -hmm. to get it. Running February first is just and then a month February later won't be enough assessment time. Right. February I mean, realistically, that's only two payrolls. Right. Okay, so February first is when we're live with it. In, in, well, that'll be gradual. So we'll you know add some departments up front beyond you know, immediately. We actually just went over this yesterday, and we'll have our meeting next week. I'll have a schedule to, to show you, so you can see all this. So we'll do some of the departments, uh, particularly we're looking at this floor uh, in, the, in the county building because the employees are either A, non-union or B, they're steel workers. So it's gonna be uh, easy just in terms of organizing in our minds what we're doing uh, with all the you know, vacation days and the sick accumulations and so on. Likely then roll that out in February. February, while we're going to go live with it, will also be our testing. So we'll know whether the system is working or not, where we're going to have our problems before we bring on the jail and the sheriff's office. A lot more nuance to it, a lot more people. But if we can get a lot of those bugs worked out with the smaller group first, it'll be ready to go. So probably sometime about March or April, we'll do the same thing with that group. Roll it out do testing while we're doing it live. So there'll probably be dual systems just to make sure everybody gets paid, uh, but uh, nevertheless, roll it out. And then finally we'll do the core group after that, we'll have everybody in place. Uh, so, but you'll see a more detailed uh, layout of that. Well, uh, if, that's, if that's pretty much a projected schedule, then I'd say the end of June. That's, that's the third end of the third quarter. It'll be seven months completely, including December because it's only the right. second day. So that puts us at the end of the quarter, the end of that particular quarter. Yeah, I think that's a decent anniversary. If you're gonna if you're gonna wait and go in the uh, go in the courts say in uh, late April, May, first of May, then that gives you another depends on how the bugs 
Yeah, it depends. Work it depends. Out. So it's and a, it's that's a, why you can always come back. If, it, yep. if we have a problem, we can always yeah, look at it again. I mean, I'll say this, but I don't know what time shared about this yesterday was in their experience in, in creating these is that we don't end up extending the time, but we end up backing uh, get the right wording right on this. Rather than say doing the sheriff's office in jail in April, we may do it in March because we're that much right. further ahead. And he said, that's more likely the scenario, but you know, if you went to June 30th, that definitely will cover what we discussed. I, that's what I would propose, June 30th, yeah. the end of June. It gives it a quarter. I don't I don't think a permanent change right now is the, no, the that's answer, not, I think. No. And then we got this new system coming on. I'm seeing, I'm already seeing the, the BSNA uh, uh, time saving already. Positive effects. Holy that, yeah. smokes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of positive stuff there. I, I, Tracy did a report for me just the other day and it was just minutes. I mean, you know, I mean, I asked her, it didn't have to be today. I mean, oh, no, right. Hey, look right over, get it. And it's printing in the other room, you know. And, and, uh, and I've seen other things like that. So I think Nova's going to do the same thing for us. So a temporary fix. I, I understand you got you got you got two young ladies in there that are are new to a lot of the systems. Uh, you're new to the system. Uh, but I'm still you, still position, doing my old job too. Yeah, yeah, part right. of it, still doing so, civil. But and so, it, you know, honestly, the I beginning think, of the year, our office we see an influx in court cases with after the new year. Unfortunately, comes divorces, a lot of them, which. That's a bigger workload for everybody, but it just, if they could have more hours to work on the stuff they need to work on, because we're going to be in court more, it would just be helpful. Anything? June 30th. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you put that on for resolution? Thank you. Nothing else, Rick? No. Mr. Ozier, come on up. Corrections Lieutenant related to job descriptions. Morning. Morning, guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for being had. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Your turn. <laughs> um, you, sh you should have the job descriptions that we prepared um, for corrections officer slash cook, corrections officer slash administrative secretary. Um, we put those together with the job descriptions of both areas of control. Um, it would be beneficial to the county if we could get to that. Some bank of liability, everybody in there would be under the same um, classification. Uh, corrections officer could work in the, uh, the administrative secretary could work in the back. Um, the cooks could work in the back. The cooks would be trained to deal with inmates and handle inmates as the corrections officer. In a, in a kitchen setting, that's pretty important. Um, we had an incident not too long ago around Zimbabwe with it, where we had a a couple of trustees get into an argument that could have got into a physical altercation. Well, the, the cook steps back because she doesn't know what to do and she's not trained to know what to do. Um, she's trained to hit the button and then people respond. Um, with the corrections officer, it probably would have been handled within moments by you shut up, you shut up, both of you sit down. I mean, and it works that way. If, if you've worked been in there, if you've got a good corrections officer, they got very good communication skills and the inmates know who can handle their business and who can't. They pick you apart. Um, liability wise, it makes sense because you have somebody in their train all the time that deals with inmates all the time. So from now on, you want to hire only only this particular type of person, corrections officer slash cook. Not there won't be any more just cooks. That would be the ideal thing to happen. As it, as we have it right now, the way we're set up, we have we have one cook that's going to retire. Uh, right. in December, and we have one that's there. Um, who we know is not here. She's off. Right. Um, her position, and, and you know, we got to go through the, the process and, and tell she well, when she comes back. Now, do we have a job description for her? There is there is a cook job description. It's, it's the same as the one that's in the, the corrections officers thing, but it doesn't have the corrections officer part. We do have one. Look. It hasn't been formally adopted in this new format. No. Oh, okay. You still have to create the individual. There still could be an independent. <laughs> you, you look on your face. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was kind of surprised when you said you had one. 
No, uh, there are certain things that are built in the SOP, but unlike the sheriff's office SOPs that has okay. lieutenants and deputies, All right, right. that's not in the jail SOP. So yeah. we would have to create just a cook. Just a cook. Yeah, correct. If that's why. Made. That's why I ask. If you're not going to have just a cook anymore, then we wouldn't need one. But if she when, comes back, she comes when she comes. When back. she comes back, I'm sorry. When she comes back, then yeah, we need a job description. That would be job, the same right? thing. Correct. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> And the same thing for the administrative secretary. If, if you hire only an administrative secretary that has no correction duties, we need a job description for that also. Correct. The ideal, the ideal thing in, in, in long term would be to get them to all be corrections officers slash court corrections officers slash administrative secretary. Yeah. In the in the future, right, is the end plan what you want to get. That way everybody in that building is trained to handle inmates and emergency makes sense. inmates and all that. It makes sense to me. But but in the short term, correct. We need job description for if that's what they are now. We need it now. Because yeah, while we're creating, it, we we yeah, go back and creating. just do the individual cook want to bring that one. Too. Yeah, yeah. Because this has already bit us, not in your department, but in no. other departments. This lack of job description. Correct. This position is replacing his wife. Correct. This position. Correct. When she retires. Correct. But. We need to hire one for the other, or it's going to just create tons of, of overtime. That's where I'm having an issue right now. I've been coming, I work weekends. And, and, and. So, what happens when I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but what happens when his, his wife retires in December? So, you're going to have to pull, are you, are you then substituting that position with a, a, another cook? So right now, you have a cook off and you have a corrections officer that's acting as a, as a cook. Correct. So what's the plan December 25th, I think is what you said, is when your wife retires, that's right? That's the last day of the payroll, yeah. 25th, an officer that's, that's um, retired MDOC that, that did food service in his career that will be running that kitchen on that shift. He's training to do it right now. And I'll have another officer that will be working on the other shift. So you're going to have two corrections officers in there at working as a cook? Correct. After December 25th? Correct. Okay. If this is approved, if not, then we'll have to start the process of trying to find cooks to hire under... Um, the way they've always been civilians you run out of time to train yeah <laughs> well <clears throat> the force of this particular person that's got mboc training and experience is a cook i mean just i mean, just you know i don't see i don't see a hurdle not passing these job descriptions but you can still be tired as a cook just and then all of his training is just an additional thing that, you know what I mean? You're saying- um, He's an officer. Oh, he's working for you now. Absolutely. Oh. He was an officer with MDOC. Okay. Officer Cook, it's the one, it's, it's they're, they're combined. I'm not sure how they did their certification with the state. But he's a certified corrections officer with the county now. Oh, okay. With, okay. With 20 right. plus you years. You told us that, he worked at Standish, right? Yeah, Standish yeah. Max. Yeah. Oh, that's- Yeah, really? it makes, a, it makes really? a transition. Yes, it makes a transition. Oh, yeah. Yeah. really well for us because he's got all that experience in there that he can relay on yeah, I, I, time with the other one. So will all these officers that are going to go into this job description um, all have to go through a food safety program? There's, I, I put in the job description, there's what they call serve safe, um, that within six months of taking this, they're going to have to pass a serve safe test. They can do it online. Obviously, we have to pay for it. It's, it yeah, I think it's $149. And that's to be a serve safe instructor, not just to pass serve safe, be an instructor. That way they can teach the inmates who are working in the kitchen to serve safe. And if those inmates want to want to get a serve safe certificate and are willing to pay for it, he can actually train them and give them the test of that. So when they leave, they could leave with a serve safe certificate. That process down there, I haven't got into that real in depth, but that's what the, the plan is. We lost a lot of programs with uh, PA 511 went away. That's the program we can do inside oh. there. What well, Michigan Works? Could they help pay for that? I've already got a call in the Michigan Works for some. Um, do you think they pay for training like that? They, yeah. they very well might. They do. I do. I do have a call into, but they changed me. A couple different people have left there now. Um, I'm waiting for a call back from a lady. Um, not waiting for that, but for academy funding. Mary Beebe is not with Michigan she Works. Nope, she left. She that's what I, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, at the EC yeah. in uh, Michigan Works, she left. So there's an open position there. But 
Um, I have a real good report with Mark uh, for Dan. He's the director. He's a president out there. So. I'm trying to think of the name they give me. There's another Brenda lady. Batch all there. Yep, that's it. She's going to be reaching back out to me on the funding, not only for that, but for academy funding to try to help mm -hmm. the process. I know Mary was looking into it when uh, the sheriff had briefly talked to her. I just want to make sure that that when this individual hopefully comes back from uh, and, and I'm an advocate for her right, right this second um, comes too. back from F FMLA leave that she's going to have a position absolutely um, and that she's not going to be forced to go get some, uh, become a corrections officer no you guys will bring her back in until she retires and then okay yes absolutely I wouldn't do that to anybody <laughs> I <laughs> no understand I just uh, yep. I, Loud and clear. Questions? I was asked, um, at, uh, I brought this up last meeting, I think at the village there, and I was asked, they were talking from a federal uh, level, because I had told them that you came to us and, and this was something that you had discussed, um, why the inmates don't do the cooking. Apparently this gentleman uh, that had brought this up to me, uh, I, I don't, he knew somebody that cooked at the federal, uh, federal apparently federal inmates do their cooking. I, I said, I'm assuming it's your guys' turnover rate is is faster than at a federal Fed, level than federal or prisons. Right, right. So they they might be there for years. Right, that's we're, we're a temporary holding facility. Basically. That was my explanation. Is there any other explanation that I didn't know about? That and and who's going to train them? You get you're in the same. They're going to be trained now. You got to have somebody to supervise them and train them to do the job. It just. Um, you can't just pull them out of the back, say, hey, you're cooking spaghetti today. Here you go. But, you know, they got to have that cook there. To, they're going to be taught to cook, to cook, to clean, to do dishes, to serve um, all the safety things you do as far as health reasons for when you serve, when you're dealing with foods, all of that. They're going to be taught that. They're going to be taught that by the cooks. Um, it's a little different than well, the cooks. We have taught them that, teach them that, too. This is actually going to be something that we can document, something that's documented. This cook's been trained to teach this, and now they're teaching the inmates that. Um, but yeah, I understand. It. But even on the state level, they don't do it that way. They have, they have actually cooks that are work for the facility, and then inmates that actually assist. My explanation was turnover. That's the only explanation I could come up That would be with. so. Why is an illegal cooking right along? Why is it who? What? He has been since we've needed since we've needed the you've been doing it cooking. Well, he can't be there seven days a week. Well, how many cooks does it take for the seven days? Two. Two. I want to but, but the way it's the way it's done now is the way it, the way it's done in the past or and up till now is they work 10 hour shifts. So a cook would come in and leave by 4 30. Um you'd have one cook working four days and the other one working three. Okay. Um and then the next the way, is the opposite. The way the way that I want to get it to um, with corrections cooks is they work the same as the, the corrections officers do now, 12 hour rotating shifts. So you have a cook come in work Monday, Tuesday, the next one will work Wednesday, Thursday, the other one will come back Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It gives you 12 hours of coverage, safety and security, same amount of hours, they're working 40, okay. broke up, but the, the security's better. They're searching these inmates as they come into the, into the kitchen, they're searching them as they're leaving and they're, and they're yeah. watching them. Yeah, the but time. I mean, if it took two cooks before, and, and Cheryl's the lawns there cooking yeah. and Perry's working. I mean, there's your two cooks. But you're pulling you're pulling an officer off the floor to do it right now. So that's where the so you're pulling an officer off shift. Are we are we okay? So are we well when you came here last you talked about a shared responsibility. They'd work both. Yes, they'd be able to respond to both. They'd be able to work both. Okay. They wouldn't so be out there though. Are you, they, are you right now hiring somebody for Perry's position? Not yet. But I, I, I need to get the approval to do that. Oh. Right now, that, he's working in there on his days off. And Cheryl, Cheryl's been working a lot of overtime on her days off to cover that vacancy. I haven't seen her in two months. <laughs> This has been how long has the other cook been off now? A couple of months. Yeah. Oh, well, I can come right, right here as soon as you. You knew she was going to be off for quite a while. Well, initially, I knew she'd be off, but she had planned on coming to work. 
that was her her plan was to to go off and be back to work within a couple of weeks while being treated and and i've dealt with that before and i had an idea but i i wasn't gonna who was then i guess are you gonna want to have three corrections officer cooks but it's like well wait a minute okay it's like the third one is almost all the time working corrections, but is a swing person and fills in. I mean, what do you do on a vacation there? Well, Every, both I, of these people got vacation. And, and that, that's where you get into this teaching the inmates to cook. They're not gonna be in there by themselves, but another correction officer will be able to come in there with the, the menu set up, be done before the officer leaves on their vacation. He follows that menu and he just watches security for those inmates and they do the cooking and he watches. But it, what's the like she said, the turnover of prisoners because you don't have anybody stays longer than a year, right? Correct. And that's what we're trying to select. We're looking at that now is trying to select the people that are there that are Ogemaw County inmates that have, are going to be there the longest. And those are the type of people we want to get in the you kitchen. You can't run out of the one. You could run out of prisoners that can't cook or mm -hmm. want to cook. You could. You can't make them cook. No. No, you can't make them. But there's a benefit to them. Um, for yeah. Because they get trustee yeah. time. But I mean, you could get to a point where you don't have somebody that wants to cook. Yeah, part of part of it right now, Craig, is okay, Cher's in there, she has female come down and help her. Yeah. There's only what 10 females in the jail. Right. It's not a, a very minimal select few that they can take down there. If they get male officers in there, they've got 70 to choose from. Well, yeah, I get it, but it's definitely going to be, where, it's definitely going to help. I don't want to, I'm, I'm, gonna, gonna, I'm trying to be proactive here and maybe have another corrections person that's trained and served, safe, ready to cook and be that swing, that swing person. Oh, I think so, he wants to do that. I think he's going to have well, that. But that'd be a third, what I'm talking about, not, not take what he's. The current, correct me if I'm wrong, the current situation will be, you'll have two correction cooks and then the third will come back from the leaves so you'll have the three to rotate okay. and then well that's what I'm, when she retires gets to a retirement or decides she's no longer going to work then we could come back and look at a then, third. You, third then you want to look at a third again because right. with with what we have now yeah. we would have three yeah because you know with, with time off and vacation and everything else you got to have a swing Correct. You know, overtime is not a swing. No, that's not a overtime to, to automatically say, "Oh, we just we just pay overtime." No, 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 no. Well, that, with this dual role, I mean, corrections officer slash cook, it'd be easy to have a third person for backup. If if there was a, a, what I'm saying is, you, you know, you have the backup. Right. The, the, you have the backup. Not yet. Not well. This guy knows how to cook. You know, I'm taking the first step. It takes time. It does. Uh, yeah, it takes time. If you get these two in the position, she comes back. You've got three, and then okay. somewhere down the line, you'll look at so the replacement for they're, they're, you got the third one right now, or you're hiring the third one. I mean, you got Perry. And the other one, we is have to hire two. We've got two that two now that have training in in kitchen food service that we want to put in there. Okay. Is Perry a cook? Or you just keep saying a, the name. I don't know. Yes, he he re, he retired MDOC. He was cook in MDOC for years. That's he's the one he from Sandwich. Yes. Yeah. So okay, that's yes. Yeah. He's an excellent cook too. He's owned a restaurant. Boy, I do see yeah. his restaurant downtown over. You guys would want to come over and have lunch with us, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Thank, Thank you. Um so could we possibly just develop some sort of an inmate food certification program so that these inmates have a benefit to going down there and helping that, out. That's the program I was talking about, the serve safe. Serve safe. Okay. Um, but but I, I I haven't dug into it deep enough. To, to be trained, they're going to actually have a certificate mm -hmm. of graduation. Right, but the, the part of that is I haven't got far enough into it to find out if the inmate has to pay a certain amount to serve safe to have that certificate, or if once we train our instructors to teach them if they can provide it at no cost. That part I don't know yet, because I don't know if that's protected through that company. Um, they'll teach our people to be instructors through that online course, but we, we, will we be able to issue a certificate? I do not know yet that yet. 
Well, I think I, they can pay for one, I'm sure, but we're not going to pay for it. If the inmate wants it, if that's what oh, it has to be, they're going to. Maybe we will. It's going to save us money. Yeah. Yeah. It saves us money down the road. I mean, sometimes you spend money to save money. It, it sounds great, but that's what happens. It's like making money. Sometimes you spend money to make money. That's my second question is what kind of an effect is this increased inmate productivity going to have on our current overtime status right now? Will that make it a lot better? You're talking about in the kitchen? Yeah. They cannot cook in the kitchen without supervision in there, without a cook in there. But you have one, you could even possibly have one supervisor in there. At a time. That's at a what time. We, that's what we have now. Yeah. Yep, that's what we use now. That's all that would be in there at a time. But if your inmates were doing the cooking, then you wouldn't need a cook, right? No, you have to have a cook. Oh, so you'd have to only have one then? Right. That's what we have now. We have one cook and then we have trustees. You cannot put inmates in the kitchen to cook for other inmates without supervision. So this you're not going to change the amount of people we have in the kitchen then? Not employees, no. Employees. But you know, we are going to change the number of trustees to three. Of visual, uh, benefits to this you know i mean when we go for if we go for a grant or we go for a special program if i think I, yeah i gotta think that if we have programs about rehabilitation that's gonna be earn us points for this, grant money and things like that yes here's a great way to do it this also saves on housing costs because the inmates that work in the kitchen get what they call trustee time they're, so they're not they're not incarcerated as long as they would have been Okay, so, so that's so a benefit. I already. spend a little money and get them a safe serve, and and then and they end up not staying as long. Well, then we're save the money we just spent. Now it's a wash. Now we're not spending money. We're saving money. I would think that'd be. I mean, it sounds great. I, I would think that'd be quite a process. And I'll tell you what. Get I, that certification I, to do that. I frequent I think that, that restaurants around here and not look back. Talks. Well, and and if you look at the population, that helps them get a job and not have to come back. Yeah, that's right. right. If that's you look at idea. if you look at the population of inmates who have been incarcerated for felonies, the the major workforce out there that the, the job that they do is in food service. Yeah, is, it's hard well, to find jobs. This is huge. That's huge with Michigan Works. Every month they give us a, a report on uh, re-enrollment uh, release programs. Uh, Michigan Works is huge into this, so I'm sure that you guys could probably partner with them if that's something you're interested in. Oh, absolutely. Um, Absolutely. That's really big with them. So I will have Mark contact you. All right, sounds good. And start to think about any other projects out there. I don't know if there's a car wash. Well, we, we have our we <laughs> have our feeling. There you go. We have our MA work crew, but we can't do it because of COVID right now. Find your success. success. That's what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. That's what they well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 4A, discussion items, legal services. Tim. Um, I've heard the, the two firms that have come in, and obviously we have the experience with Foley and Mansfield. Uh, so this is the part where you all get to discuss what you want to do moving forward. Uh, I'll facilitate that. Do we have a third coming? No, that third one, um, I'm forgetting the name of the firm already. The attorney that would have been assigned to us left the firm. Uh, since these proposals were presented. Okay. And they, there was a range depending on the individuals um, who were assigned to the county, ranging from something very reasonable to something that was very unreasonable, uh, upwards of $30, $350 an hour. And oh, suddenly really? it wasn't um, as viable, I guess, mm. because they were focused so on the it, uh, Holy Mansfield, did they? Well, they're already in the mix because okay. you know that. So okay. you know, All right. clearly they're they're a choice, you know. Okay. How did that okay. come okay. I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. No, how did that conversation go with Greg yesterday? You told Greg we were doing this. How did how did that go? He was understanding, very professional. Um, it just said the board knows who we are and what we do and okay. trust that that reputation is known to everyone. So I got a phone call shortly after. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. You had a question. Go ahead. How much are we paying for the Mansfield per hour? 185 an 185. hour. So we're right at 185. And then with the proposal, yeah, with 
Cold Stone Corn Tosca, it was 195 if we didn't go the, right. the option three retainer thing. And then with when it was this year, it was 225. Right. How many hours? I know you did an assessment last. You did an assessment how many hours we paid fully in Mansfield or how many hours they billed us for. Do you recall that? Right. I recall it. Yeah, you said like their hybrid. Their hybrid program would be about the same what we were. We, Which would have been about the, the same. last guys. Eight. Cold. Right. I wanted to see what it was to the 225. Yeah. Uh, well, wasn't it 48? 48 something? And, and right. I, it was 48 for the hybrid uh, retainer, right. I guess. Right. Uh, and just to clarify what the retainer covered, it literally is everything short of some form of litigation. So we're the additional charge would come in would be for the court if they had to litigate something. Right. Or if we had a, an arbitration, which the likelihood is greatly reduced now that our contracts are, are all approved. Uh, and then any like a Merck hearing or anything like that that we'd have to have. So if there's a hearing involved or a court appearance that needs to be made, there'd be an extra charge. Everything else would be part of that retainer. So if the clerk had a question about uh, a function of elections, that would be covered. Registered deeds had a question about, uh, I don't know, something that the registered deeds got caught up in. Uh, it's right. part of that retainer. Uh, treasury specifically mentioned as well, if there was a question about treasurer in there, that would be covered. Uh, you know, one, you know, we, Commissioner Vaughn and I talked a little bit about uh, the zoning amendment coming forward, that would be covered. Uh, and that would be something that uh, the attorneys could be brought in on the ground floor of the initial discussion of a zoning change uh, covered. So literally the day-to-day -day functions covered. The only thing's not covered is if we take have to go to the next step with uh, a litigation or some kind of a hearing. Um, so 48,000 divided it by 195. Well, I just did some quick math. Yeah. If we were at 48,000 with Floyd Mansfield, we're paying them 185 an hour. That's just shy of 260 hours, come up to 259 something. So let's say it's 260 hours with um, <laughs> firm that was here today, Foster and Swift, that would work out to $58,500. So you look at another $10,500 differential in cost if we use. Same amount of hours, basically. So, which hopefully we don't. It was a rough year, right? Um, the way I, yeah, the way I figured it, it was about ten percent higher for coal stoker, and then it was another ten percent higher for these guys. So right now we got three on the table. We got Foster Swift, we have Cole Stoker, and Toski, and we have Bully and Mansfield. So I'm going to ask each one of you guys your opinion, Commissioner Vaughn. Um, the one that was here today, uh, I was impressed. They seem to have quite a team. Um, that's, a, that's a major plus. Um, the guy that was here like a week ago, very personable. I really, I don't know, he seemed to be really, um, I say upfront and personable. I, uh, I think he'd be real easy to work with. Um, I'd be happy with either or. So but, what is your choice? Um, Probably the guy a week ago. Okay. Commissioner Newbecker? Um, I was somewhat impressed by the guy last week, uh, but I was a little bit more impressed by the commitment um, today by Foster Swift. Um, and it uh, seems like they're, uh, they're pretty dedicated uh, to every one of their clients. And that's one of my biggest concerns is because of our location, are we gonna be taken care of uh, properly? And it sounds like they've already got a commitment in this county already. Um, and I guess unless we hear any negative opinions, uh, that's that's my choice, Ms. Foster. Ms. Foster, Foster and Swift. Commissioner Sorry. I was very impressed with today with Foster. Swift. I love the fact that they've got, you know, very specific litigators that, you know, are the subject matter experts. Still, I go back to, you know, and I, I go back to my past experience with Stoker and Tosky. 
that's my choice. They've always, my past experience with them, they were great. I, Tim, I know you worked with them when you were in Agam County. You know, they represent MAC. Um, my choice. My pick. Mr. Scott? I concur. I mean, Cole Thorker, they have a team. He didn't bring them with him. He, they didn't come on Zoom or anything else. They have they have everything that the other one has. I think he laid it out better as far as the communication. He laid out absolutely, he was right on, right on point about how he would communicate with everyone. Everyone was in the loop. Uh, those, those are the things I like. They did represent counties up here in the north a lot more than I saw today. I like these guys. They're all right. I mean, they're all professionals. I mean, I get that, you know. But Cole Stoker stood right out. With me. So. Oh, Jen? <laughs> I thought they both did a very nice job. I'm going to disagree. I, I like the Foster Swift, um, again, their commitment today. Um, I like the straight up fee of 225. There's no what covers what. Um, I, I like that. I like that they have specialty, they, especially with our hot type ticket items going into next year, which is the drainage, the millages, um, you know, the, the packet they put together. Uh, I, I was most impressed um, by them. And also somebody that has ties here, um, I think is also uh, another plus. Um, obviously uh, that individual cares, uh, cares about this community. And um, she, the other one uh, works for two of the libraries, I think she said here locally. Um, so again, that just shows that they already do have connections to this uh, uh, county and uh, care about this county. So I, my vote is for Foster Swift. Um, I, again, I like that 225. We know what it's going to cost. There's no hidden fees there. We, there's, there shouldn't be any surprises. Um, they took quite a bit of time for three of them to come up here and, and uh, put together their uh, uh, their skill. So that's, that's mine. But if, if you didn't want to go with the retainer, you know, I mean, Cole told Grantowski, option two is the flat 195 and all. Right. You know, so. Again, I, I think they, they did a better job presenting. That other gentleman, I agree, was extremely, extremely uh, friendly. Um, did a great, did, did a nice job. He already has a report with you. Um, I don't think a fresh start's a bad, a bad thing either. I like the retainer thing. I, I like that hybrid retainer thing. I really do. I think, and I and, agree. And Cole, uh, Cole Tosky, was, you know, he was he was adamant about being in our meetings. Uh, either he didn't have to be here. We offered him Zoom, and, and that will work. He, he was ready to sit in in all the meetings. Have, have one of their people sit in in all our meetings. I think that's huge. I mean, that's one thing that we've asked Mr. Mann to be in a lot of our meetings and, and he has been in some and then some you haven't been able to even get a hold of during the meeting. I, I can say that we and got so, a bill. We we he we got one right after he commented on that. And we've not received another bill on the meetings that he's attended. Right, correct? Oh, yeah. that, that was backed out too when he was <laughs> Brought to his attention. So. Yeah, yeah. Right. So he can correct that. Right. I, I like the retainer thing. I, I, I don't see much of a reduction in, in the use of attorneys in the, in the next year or two. I think that I think we're going to have to we're going to have to tap attorneys for more, even more stuff because we're still playing catch up with a lot of stuff that the, the county has not been doing over the last few years, and. Uh, uh, so I, I think we're going to, and, and just like Tim just explained, all the different things that goes under that retainer. I mean, you know, the questions, the questions coming from all the department, uh, the, the, uh, the elected officials, uh, that's all under the retainer. I mean, and I don't even know that our elected officials have, have, have uh, utilized all the all the uh, information that's available yet from these. So to have that cap, to have that there, you know, I mean, if, if we overuse it, then they'll come back the next, at the end of the contract term and want to adjust that retainer. 
And then then that would give us a signal too. But I don't I don't you know the way I got it from these guys from good enough there was uh uh you know you, you want you, you want to want me to call in and set during your meeting and just listen to everything like the city of DeWitt wanted. Well I'm gonna charge you 225 right in a minute. It starts right to the minute you return, you know. The retainer covers that with Coltoski. So they'll, they'll sit in the whole meeting, you know, it's covered. If our meeting goes longer, it's covered. It goes shorter, it's covered. So it looks like it's, go ahead. I, I guess my, my main concern, retainer, no retainer, whatever, but um, quality of service is my main concern. And, um, I just got a better feeling of commitment out of them today than from the current administration and also the uh, last one last week. Um, I, I want to make sure that they have our, our best interests um, at the top of their list. I'll go on uh, too, but I just think it's cool possible to do that. But Especially, we have, we have some hot ticket, ticket items in the next year. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We're going to need and, and desire good legal representation. Absolutely, people who specialize in and and both these both these folks got they got big teams. They got big teams. I mean, they, they, I know he he really expounded on that, but uh, Mr. Norstrom or whatever his name was, uh, uh, he did too. Yeah, he just didn't bring him along and everything else. But you know, I don't know. that's what concerns me. Well, yeah, you really wanted the job. And yeah. they could have been in Zoom. They could have did the exact same thing. Yeah, they could have. They could have. But, and they did. You know, well, that's fine. That's fine. <clears throat> I know they got it. Okay. I, I agree and disagree with. It was a night meeting yeah. versus a day meeting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so. That's where I'm at. Do we need to make a decision at the next meeting? I mean, it sounds like it's. It's uh, might as well put that on you guys uh, with the retainer. I think that was option three, right? Yes, option three. That's where I'm at. Cole Toski was the option three. I, mean, I don't That's think we're gonna, well. I'm not going to sway, but there, there's three to two. Or three to three, so yeah, that's fine. Go ahead and put that on. Item 4B, we have the ORB update. Do you have one, Tim? I don't have any more input. I don't know if you've heard anything. I spoke, I went to the road commission meeting last week and they brought it up. We talked about it quite a bit. The state law says that you need to ride to the to the farthest to the right side of the road. They had really liked the RVs to stay right up on the pavement. Their shoulders are getting tore up. Yeah, and they said if, if that was the case, um, they don't have a problem with the speed issue, um, whatever it is. They're kind of they're a little bit, you know, you you run up on 120 miles an hour. It can be a hazard. You know, it's a it's an Amish buggy with lights on it. That's basically what it turns out to be. You know, but you know, you got bicycles on the road and stuff like that. Um, and they didn't have any problem with hours. Any any hours was fine because they're all lit up and everything. Uh, but they'd like to see them up on the roadway and not on the shoulder. But I'm sure not quite I'm sure the law enforcement was not wanting to see him on the, and well, I'm sure the citizens aren't well, either. You know, well, <laughs> I don't, because that's the I, I, biggest complaints I hear. They're on the road and they're doing 50 miles an hour. Are, well, you know, well, you know, the speed is one thing, but you know, the thing is, is you know, I, I worked in St. Helen for five years up there, and they run down the side of my road and, and uh, out there, and it throws stones all over the road and it creates dust going down the road i mean just go into st helen any day during the summer and you got a dust storm you know and even though they pay a little wider shoulder you know um but yeah, i was surprised i was surprised the road commission even said that because usually well usually well you know i was in the trucking business for years you know i was so nobody should drive on a road and it'd be fine. The road would never break up if nobody rides on it, you know. But I was really surprised that they they had that. I would I would have thought I would have thought 
talking to them, they would say, we don't want them out there at all. You know, and I haven't heard that yet. And I haven't heard that in any of the townships yet uh, about excluding any roads. I I could understand it if, if the township and or city wanted to exclude certain roads, you know, other than highways, main roads. You know. well, I think Rose City already has. They have they have their signs up their directions. Oh, their alleys. Certain, yeah, their alleys yep. and stuff that they want the four wheelers on. They don't want them on every road in the city or Rose City. Yeah. You know, right. That's been a given from the beginning. Right. And they have they can do that. They you know any township can put an ordinance in strengthening the existing law. You know. But uh, I was I was I don't know. I, I was hoping I don't know if the police can turn around and send us something on paper. But that's what they they told me. I would hope that we'd get correspondence from all the townships. Did you hear back from any? No, no, other than the ones I've already reported on. Uh, I know Logan was going to talk about that at a future meeting. I don't know when they meet. That's right. Okay. So they may have, uh, and there was one other township um, coming to me tonight. Yeah. One of them, uh, the supervisor sent me an email, said they were going to talk about it too. So I think by the time January rolls around, we'll be if you're heard from one or two more. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, item 4C, the ARPA. Hey, I'm going to ask you to do a couple things on ARPA. Um, you have the latest updated list, uh, and obviously we have another one that came today with NMCAC. Um, a couple of things. The first thing I'd like you to do, if you were uh, of a mind, is to actually put a resolution on next week that will first recognize a uh, calculation for the lost revenue. And what I want to ask you to do this for is because this will now kind of free us up a little bit more just in terms of how you end up spending the dollars. We've talked about this in the past. They talked about how uh, calculations showed that all the ARPA dollars could be categorized as lost revenue, which is one of those categories that the uh, uh, federal government has already recognized. So that would be just the formal action to actually recognize that that's been done. Second item on you see right at the top of the project list is that we put uh, 500,000 for each of the fiscal year. Uh, okay, maybe a misprint, maybe not, but I was gonna say for fiscal year 21 and 22, uh, at least recognizing that uh, 500,000 literally is lost revenue to the general fund. And then the third thing I would suggest and just maybe you uh, uh, talk about it here is that uh, we put the formal request to the departments or county projects. So we've had a few of them that we've talked about. We've talked about generator for this building. We've talked about, uh, there was a, a body scanner at the jail. Uh, we've talked about loosely uh, the entrance to this building and maybe making it ADA compliant and so on. That um, what I would just suggest is that we put the call out formally now to the departments, tell us what those projects are bring those back so that one of the January cow meetings, we have the list of what those are and can begin weighing which ones you wanna think about. And this is just, again, my thinking and need to talk about this as a board uh, for consistency is that we end up taking care of our issues first. Uh, and again, that they end up being one-time projects and not long-term uh, you know, committing to a position or anything. But get that process going, and then that'll help by the time the second uh, installment comes in, probably, I forget, is it March or May? I think it's May, uh, that those projects will have already, you have discussed those, so they'll be in the works. We'll know then about uh, how much is left over if you want to put those out into things like the library request or any other nonprofits that are out there. Uh, but it'll also give you the experience of having gone through that internally and now you know what to look for and what you want to require uh, and uh, put the call out into the community. I agree and I think um, I think we need to the fibers need to get to a some level of agreement. Do we want to first prioritize county? Or are we going to mix everybody in, every every everything on the list in, and then weigh it out? 
I would like to see county items weighed, weighed the heaviest. So that's like, like Tim just said, prioritize county things first. If there's anything left over, then we start looking at things older. And Mark's idea with, with uh, uh, shared cost. Collaboration? Think, yeah, collaboration, I think is a great way to do outside stuff, you know, like you mentioned with the, with that library elevator, there's five other entities involved in this, four townships in the city. You know, if they kicked in, even if they, even if they kicked in a, a percentage and just, just, just for an idea's sake, the five of them paid 50% of it, the county paid 50%. Of it. Just an idea, not necessarily a stone. Maybe it's, maybe it's more like 84, 80, 20 or something like that. I don't know. But uh, for things outside, but I think there's enough things. I think there, if we really look at things, there's going to be a lot of things right here at the county, at the county level. And I'd just like to know between the five of us if we agree to first prioritize the county. Mr. Sirick? Well, I think we should definitely prioritize, you know, what needs to be done for infrastructure for county itself. Um, and again, you know, I, I go back to you know, what Craig said. If, when we start looking at these outside projects, you know, if there is collaboration money is available. You know, some some organizations don't have that ability to take them and provide any matching funds, let's say, you know, so we couldn't do a use the um what it was here today from uh, assessment. Uh, yeah. She's asking for five thousand. They really don't have the ability to take it, you know, say, hey, if you give us five thousand, we'll, you know, we've got another source to to match your, you know, to provide a percentage of that funding. You know, so you've got to I think look at those that don't have that ability separately from ones that do have the ability. I don't think it's fair to to look at. Let's say, use let's use a library for example. You know, library wants eighty six thousand dollars, and if nobody's willing to kick in, I'm not so willing to take and give the library their eighty six thousand dollars when I can look at another agency that doesn't have the ability to take in another source to provide some funding. I would weigh that one more heavily than I would one that's just flat out, you know, give me the money. Mr. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So I hope you guys understand what I'm trying to say, but I, uh, I'm kind of uh, agreeing with Craig. <clears throat> um, I guess the way I look at it is getting the biggest bang for our buck for the whole county. Um, what's going to benefit most everybody in the county? Um, that's quite a sum of money, and, and I think it can benefit a uh, whole, whole heck of a lot of people. Well, I definitely think that there's a there's a huge need inside the county for um, some capital investments that we need to make. Repairs to buildings. But there are other other needs in the county as well. Um, this one that comes to mind is the half empty school in Rose City that we still aren't doing anything with. There's, there's lots of needs. Well, I guess I, when I say I, county, hang on just a second. Well, when I, I say county, I mean Craig. It's my county here. My, hang on, it's my okay. turn. Okay. <laughs> so my my opinion on this is is uh, I think we should put the request out there, see what the county needs are, um, take a look at all of those, and then make a decision from there. I mean, we don't even know necessarily. We're making assumptions of what the needs are, but I think put the request out there to the department heads, to the elected elected officials, and then sit down and talk about this. Um, I think we're all hearing at our township meetings what they're thinking, how they want to spend their their monies, um, along with our boards, and, and so I think we have an idea of what the needs are at our at the individual level or at the uh, township levels. But I think I think we need to continue to talk about this, put this out there, see what these needs are, and then bring it all back to the table. Um, I think we can be the spokesperson 
from our township levels of what they're discussing and what their needs are. And I think that can be part of this continued conversation. Commissioner Scott. Well, I just, when I say county, I mean the county government. There's not every entity within the county. I mean, when I say county, I, I'm excluding townships. I'm excluding the cities. I'm talking about our infrastructure that we own here, our assets that, that the Ogma County government owns. I don't mean to say, you know, they, the townships, the cities, the nonprofits, the services that we don't pay for or we don't, we don't own, you know, uh, uh, to per se, that's separate. Anything that's got a separate income other than us is separate. Take care of us first. Then if we have something left over, we go and start looking at it and have a process to weigh out priorities. I I'd like to prioritize what we have. I think that's what all of us just said, that we are looking at the county level, put the, put, put the request out there to the department heads, to the elected officials okay. to see what their, their right. needs so are. You, you expounded on townships too. I, no, what I said was, let's see what their needs are, continue to discuss what our townships are requesting. We go to the meetings every month. We hear how their, what their needs are, how they're wanting to spend their money, what their ideas are. I think we can continue to discuss that. But in the meantime, let's see what is needed at the county level. I, mean, I don't think we need to stop those communications, but I, I think we no, can I, further discuss I, that. I'll tell you, four, four million over the next, the next couple of years. It sounds like a lot of money, but when you're looking at a quarter of them Correct. going for one project there, and we got projects a lot bigger than that. But I don't think we can make any decision until we know what the needs are. And I think the way to do that is to put it out there to ask. And at the next uh, COW meeting, uh, I began formulating like review criteria. So start discussing that before all of them land here, I'm gonna say mid-January, They'll have an idea of what you want to look for. And when you talk about weighting, if there are certain um, uh, issues that get resolved, maybe it gets weighted higher. So when you talk about weighting, how we would do that, make it uh, you know, a fair evaluation for everybody. But at the end of the day, uh, you could have you know, projects that are really good, but you think one down here is going to have the most impact, you get to put it at the top of the list. But at least to give you some way to um, you know, compare the projects and then make the call. I guess I'm, what I'm saying is we, get, we weigh out all the, our own stuff first. And then when we're done with that, we're done with weighing out ours. And we spend all the money in the, on the stuff that the county owns. Then if there is something left over, and I'm going to tell you, I, I don't think there's going to be much. And then, then we start looking at everything else. And then we can weigh out if it's going to be municipalities before, before uh, 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 nonprofits or, or they're all in the mix. But that's a whole separate discussion, I think. I don't, again, I don't disagree with that, but it doesn't mean that if something's brought to one of us that we can't bring it next at the next committee of the whole when we're discussing this, that we can at least bring it to the table. Oh, that, that's fine. All I, I guess what I'm saying is two different lists. Two different lists we're running. That's what I'm saying. All the stuff under the county right here, all the other stuff, townships, nonprofits, assessment centers outside the county. I don't disagree with that. Okay, that's what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is I'm hoping that we can we can say that we're gonna look at this. I don't wanna I don't wanna I'd rather not compare a county project with a township project at the same level. I want to wait till I get a county stuff done, and then I'll look at the township stuff in a separate, off the separate list. If there's any money left over after here, then we'll grab up the, the other list and start looking. That's where I'm at. I, I, I hear you. You, you repeated it, so I get I know, it. I know, I <laughs> know. But again, we are constituents' voice, so I don't, I don't want to say for sure that our list of our county is going to be completed before we look at this other list. Well, that's your so voice. I'm not 100% on board with that, but it did help um, with that education that took place uh, at, through uh, EDC there in Michigan Works. MSU uh, was part of that as far as these, these townships are still 
uncertain of how to spend it. And um, so any more education I'll, that I hear about, I will forward to you and you can distribute. Um, the townships were very pleased with that. I had a, a one asked me yesterday in a store if, if they have to put the ARPA money in a separate fund or if they can put it, like I'll, I'll ask and I'll get back to you, but anyways. And you know, first thing I would suggest they do is go through that exercise to determine their lost revenues. They might find it all fits into that category just like we did. And then really it's it opens up the floodgates to anything you want. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we got over the next four years, five hundred thousand dollars each year. So that's so, all spend them money. Right now you need but a I'd like to get a consensus from the rest of the board here because I feel there's a consensus here of what they uh, did. They all stated their opinion. Correct? Well, we already went around to everybody. Make a motion that matters from the floor. That's where we were going for the, that's okay. what I was gonna say all next. Right. Right. So we have the resolution you want you want for the meeting for calculation for lost revenues, correct? Yeah, you need that. recognize that, right? You also need the five hundred thousand dollars for the fiscal year twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, correct? And the only other thing you requested at this time was a formal request to go to county department heads and elected officials, correct? Right. So we covered the three things you asked for. Yes. Okay. What was the second thing? The $500,000 for fiscal year 2021 and 2022. That's all you need right now. That's that's all I'm asking. Okay. And we'll continue to put this on at the next. Oh. Correct. Yeah. Okay. You'll see this as a standing item on the call. Anything so else, Commissioner Set? Already... Uh, right now okay perfect also. we have the next is a gps oh i'll let brad talk about that first <laughs> thank you that's why i turned and looked at mr commissioner Becker. Well, i know we've talked about this in the past i just think it's uh important that we get a committee together um with uh, all of the different agencies in the county um, whether it be uh ems transit the sheriff's department um and uh, develop a, a system to incorporate GPS um, asset tracking um, response type system, and then see what the uh, the cost would be on that. I don't think it's going to be all that um, consuming, but I think it would be a very beneficial uh, tool for all three departments or agencies to be able to benefit from. Um, so I guess what my proposal is, is to get a uh, representation from the board, county administrator, sheriff's department, EMS, 911, and transit. Am I leaving anybody out? Well, we we're talking about any vehicle or building, yep. zoning. Yep. Um, but as far as anything at all. I mean, other than just GPS asset tracking, I'm just talking about like for response system. Right. Do you um, want to include safety. The, like fire departments in that? That's, yeah, okay. If, if I don't they know if there's a county rep that, that um, if they'd like to, they don't care cost. City of West Branch, Rose City, maybe, everybody. Maybe uh, Mike Bowers is our guy. Mike yes. Bowers as well. Yeah. Yep. Mike and Mike had some um, ideas. Um, EMS also had some ideas. As to some systems that they're currently running already. So, but definitely open to any ideas on uh, what the best system would be that 911 could obviously utilize. And I think that, well, hopefully there would be some type of insurance benefits that come out of it as well. So, your, your question is Can we have Tim, reach out to these entities and schedule a meeting um, with uh, at least two of us commissioners on it as well. Try to get something set up. We definitely should be one. You've, you're initiating this. Yep, I'll do that. I'm on the uh, insurance committee. I can, I can volunteer for that. Any, any, well, you two perfect because because be good for it. Thank you, Commissioner Scott. Oh, I any other discussion on that? I don't think so, but I do. What do you think, Mark? Pardon me, what do you think? I think it's a great idea. I definitely 
let's explore it and see what the bottom dollar cost is. Hopefully, like you said, it's not going to be that much. Is, but... is it something you would like to do? Would you like to be on oh, the God, game? yeah. If you don't. Oh, I mean... go ahead. Speak up. <laughs> Well, no, I don't want to be the ball hog. No, you, know? no. <laughs> you have more expertise than I do, so no, and that no, no, may, no. And you know what? Maybe a good a fresh set of eyes, somebody that's not jaded like I might be, Are you jaded? might be a good thing. It's it's your call. I, you know? I don't care. I mean, I'd be more than happy to do it, believe me. I really would. But So go ahead. It's You're the chair. It's your call, girl. Go ahead, Commissioner Silbert. All right. If I think you've done a poor job, I'll step in. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm on the EMS board too, so I, I I'll touch base with. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have a hand in it. Either, so, because so. I'm trying to think, Paul's on the board too, and I'm going to work with Paul. Did we? Make, got something, don't they? Did we make a decision on the secretary? Um, did you? Where are we with that? That's not on here. It's not. Um, last meeting, uh, you discussed uh, to the conclusion that the personnel. Committee uh, would be the to the sit in with me on the interviews. I did put the job up on it's on the website now. I posted it to Indeed on Monday and had to pause it on Tuesday because 37 applications had already come in. Uh, of those 37, I would say probably about half a dozen just weren't qualified and they already disposed of those by okay. about half, then six, maybe as many as eight. Um, the, I mean, there's just nothing yeah. in the background that would suggest that this was a field they had any uh, desire in at all. Mm -hmm. uh, some very good ones that have come through, uh, others that maybe we need a little, a little bit more vetting. Uh, but what I'll do, at least my plan is, uh, give it a probably a boost another uh, three next Friday on our web page, uh, because that's actually drawn a few as well. Uh, and then uh, I'll get with uh, the committee and we will you know, select probably our top five. I'm gonna say, uh, yeah, in for, for interviews. Because I didn't. I, I guess I'm gonna disagree with you in that aspect. I know that was thrown out there, but we didn't come up with a. I, I would like to talk about that. We did not come up with a conclusion as far as what we were gonna do as far as interviewing and in, in going forward. You had we had talked about it. Then we we heard from him, yeah. uh, Commissioner Scott, and then <laughs> it was kind of left. Yeah. Now, did anybody else? Did anybody else reach out to you afterwards? <laughs> I know I sent you an email. You sent me the email. That's the only other conversation I've had. Was Comm Commissioner Vaughn, are you interested in anything else different taking place with the secretary position as far as hiring process? No, I, from my understanding, like I say, the, him and him, <laughs> him and him, <laughs> we're going to sit with him and take care of that. So that was kind of my. Again? Well, I think that uh, most of the process could be handled through the uh, committee that we already have developed. Um, I guess I would like to. Maybe see like the like Tim said the, the top five or top three candidates um, for the whole board to review. To review and then this is going to be a secretary for the board as a whole and for Tim as well. Commissioner Sobrek, I'm open so, to what? <laughs> I I think it can be handled, by, but if you. <laughs> if you want to sit in on it, I, I do not. Mind. You can ask him on my email said. What did I say? <laughs> she had, I think you well, could be him or her. I had no interest in okay. doing it. I was stepping away, but I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to 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 voice what they would like. Yeah. That is not the feeling that I. You know, I mean, if, if if somebody else would like to sit on it, you know, I'll bow out and, and Craig and somebody. You know, I didn't know if you wanted to or not. I do not. Um, you know, I think that we can. You know come to a fair conclusion and, and then, you know, let the rest of the board review. I don't, I don't know, you know, you probably don't want to get into the interview process, but say, Hey, these are the, the top three, top five, you know, this is our recommendation after you look at them, yep. you know, if that's the way you want, I think that's fair. So agreed. At least so we all have feel like we, we have a say. You've got eyes on it. And, yes. you know, I mean, it's not just, you know, these two and Tim making the decision, everybody's got input into it, which is, this is the right thing to do. Mr. Scott. So we are going to do what exactly? I try to spare you the, some of the day-to-day -day things. Um, we can, I, I mean, I can certainly whittle them down to the 
candidates who meet the qualifications, the minimum qualifications, and let each commissioner look at every one of those and you know give us your top five. And then we could kind of all compare notes that way. But I'm telling you right now, it is tedious. And when there are this many, um, you're talking a lot of time going through each one of these and trying to remember how did this compare to that one and, and you know, doing your, your own ranking. And even with a score sheet, that gets tough because, gosh, is that skill really that much better than what this person uh, put out? And that's the level of uh, detail that I try to spare you of because it is tedious and it does get time consuming. But if you're interested in doing it, the more the merrier. Um, you know, happy to. Uh, I say to top three. That, so. I think all we need to see is a top three. You, you three can decide all the way down to the top three, and then we can. Can can you send out top three, top five, top ten to each one of us, and then poll us and not can violate you, the open meeting? You thing? respond to me. You don't talk to one another. <laughs> okay, you're good. Okay, and I'll, again, we'll put the little. Uh, uh, reply. Well, just Forward. it won't be a reply all. That, that won't be an option. Right. So that won't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so you would have to consciously you know, right. do things wrong, you know, which which you won't do. So, uh, but yeah, that's that's the, the key. Otherwise, if you're collaborating together, then we're going to have to do that at a meeting. Here, you're just looking at candidates and telling me here's who I think are the top ones. The committee will meet, and you know, we'll obviously keep everybody informed of every step of the way, but. That way you avoid that that trap of violating open meetings. Are you guys good with top three? I think it'll be top five. Okay. I, I, I do have yeah, five. I'm fine with them figuring out who the top five is with Tim, and then we can decide Perfect. in a meeting from there. Okay. Top five. Uh, there's nothing. Oh, public comment. This is the final public comment. So this is for anything. Any public comment in the room? Any public comment on the phone? Come on, sure. If you're going to give us some update on something, you got you're in the paper. Is there any public comment on the phone? No public comment. So, Greg, are you on the phone? He's not on the phone. I just checked email. He hasn't emailed anything in either, so he may still be in whatever that hearing was. Yes. Yeah, so this was going to be related to the KCC millage. Um, can I, I forwarded those emails yesterday. Can I, can you distribute them to the commissioners so they can get caught up to date on what's going on? And we can put this on uh, next week if we have to go into closed session then. There is some hopefully positive updates and I can leave it at that for right now. Is that it? So. so we're not going to be with him then? He's not. We can't have a closed meeting. I asked him. We can have a, I, I, yeah, I can't discuss it or uh, without our attorney present in a closed session. And he, I did talk to Greg yesterday. He recommended these updates in a closed session. So, yeah. yes, sir. A little quick update. Uh, cast off a total of 25 churches. Um, a correctional, or I'm sorry, our um, academy for the two individuals in Delta graduate in weeks away. We'll start on them. Uh, Shop of the Hero is going well. Uh, article. I've got two articles coming out in the papers for two in depths. So I just put the whole long clear background there, just read so on and so forth. Uh, there would also be an article on a correctional officer that was graduated uh, that, uh, graduated from the correctional academy. So that's the one that's pictures in the paper today. Is it today? Well, I looked at the okay. online paper okay. yesterday. Okay, yes, it may have been. But anyway, that's out there. And our, our night shift is going well. That's the biggest news. Yeah, it's going well. Uh, all year. They worked last last weekend, um, started last Friday. Not a lot of activity out here, but they were hitting a lot of townships. I was looking at their, uh, their daily and they're out there they're being seen. What nights are they currently, because townships are asking, what nights are they uh, working? The thing is, Jenny, 
it's on a rotation thing. Okay. I don't want to give out the dates and times because I don't want the thieves to know when we're working. So that's that's fair. How many? So when we're asked, so we're all given the same information. How many nights then per week? Out of seven nights, how many um, nights is night? Well, one week it'll be four. The next week it'll be three. Okay. In, in two weeks, we should have within that time period, we should have two more trains. They're, they're coming down to almost the end, and we're going to put them up on nights that will be full staff. We're looking at two weeks, maybe even sooner. So it all depends on uh, where we end up training schedule with these and they're both going to be very good for us so when it's full staffed it's seven nights yes. a week okay yeah, it's coming just want to make sure we're all telling just everybody the make same sure these two individuals that are getting trained are, are ready for everything so, okay. so what's the timeline on that the end of january no two weeks two weeks or less Two week, two weeks after they graduate, they'll be on no, 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 no. oh no two what i'm asking now. is two, we're training two more right seven, now. seven days a week When's that start? Two weeks or less. We we'll have full staff up on the nights. All right, all right. Because you promised me back a few months ago, you well, stood right should, there. They, things turn. So, uh, yeah, but you promised me. Sheriff, it's just our our townships are are meeting this week and into next week, and I just want to make sure we're when we're asked, we're giving accurate information. We should we should be up and running no later than two weeks if everything is on schedule. You'll keep us updated. Absolutely. Thank you. So we'd, we'd be safe to say. January first, just in case. I, I'm looking at mid December. Yes, yes, January B. I, I'm just saying. Yeah. We all know things can go yeah. south in a, yeah. in a hurry. They're training right now, and it, they're they're excellent. They'll be good. So it, anticipated it is in two weeks, but and that's the guarantee. That's no guarantee. Oh, January is what he promised. Uh, I got. Uh, I did. Mr. Spencer yeah. just let me know that people complain they can't hear he's saying people should that address us need to be at the table Just thank you let you know what our IT type. thank you okay. so can you provide those updates very similar again next week at the meeting yeah. thank you can we have a motion to thank adjourn your dog catcher for giving us a nice report we have a motion to adjourn i second that motion to adjourn meeting adjourned at 11 21 Nice. Thank you guys with the